We're going to get started. Members, we're going to start. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome the student representatives who are with us, Marta Dean and Mason Schlieff. Um, we will, there, it notes that there's the potential for a break at the call of the chair, uh, but I plan on plowing through so that we can hit the snow and plow through that uh, afterwards. <laughs> Some of y'all caught that, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so we will start with uh, somewhat of a continued conversation, but specific to the Rochester campus, uh, focused around uh, system-wide enrollment planning. This is the fourth uh, of our system-wide campus-specific conversation. It'll culminate in five-year enrollment plans that the administration will bring forward for our review at the March meeting. I want to note before we begin that this one will be different than our previous conversations due to the unique nature of the Rochester campus, its size, and its relative newness. We're going to hear more about the campus planning for the future and not just enrollment during the presentation. And while the presenters come on up, I will first turn to the president uh, for opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, I am delighted to tee up this conversation about strategic enrollment and planning for the University of Minnesota Rochester. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our intent today is to discuss the results of a comprehensive long-range planning endeavor for the Rochester campus, including the rationale for enrollment growth at UMR and initiative to generate increased enrollment. Chancellor Carroll and Assistant Vice President Carlson's presentation is a result of intensive strategic planning involving industry partners, UMR alumni, faculty, staff, and students, system colleagues with relevant expertise, potential and current academic program partners, higher education innovators, and community leaders. We couldn't think of anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> UMR's presentation uh, today connects to a series of ongoing discussions about strategic enrollment across the system. In December of 18, I remind you, you heard an enrollment management presentation from University of Minnesota Duluth leaders. Earlier last year, you reviewed and discussed enrollment plans with leaders from the University of Minnesota's Morris and Crookston campuses. And later this afternoon, Acting Provost McMaster will provide an update on the Twin Cities campus's five-year enrollment plan, which we've done every year since you approved that plan in January of 16. So after today, you will have heard presentations from every campus individually about their enrollment planning. We've been providing campus-specific enrollment plans at the request of the board. At the same time, we are mindful of the interconnectivity of our great university and are moving forward with system-wide strategic enrollment planning. You heard from the System Enrollment Council in June of 18, and we're scheduled to provide another update to you in June of 19. We are stronger together, and we appreciate the board's direction to move forward with this essential system-wide strategic priority. So returning to UMR, I'll turn over the microphones now to Dr. Lori Carroll, Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Rochester, and Link Carlson, Assistant Vice President for Institutional Analysis in the University's Office of Finance. Thank you. Thank you, President Kaler. Chancellor Carroll and Assistant Vice President Carlson, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Omari and President Kaler. Regents, we're so pleased to be presenting these plans today. Uh, we're glad to have the opportunity. These are exciting times for Rochester and for the university system as a whole. And while we work together on a system enrollment plan, each of the five campuses is also busy recruiting the upcoming class based on our distinctive identities. At UMR, we are in the middle of a five-year enrollment plan. That established plan is included in your docket materials. As you know, we're on target to continue the projected growth of at least an additional 50 undergraduate students per year through recruitment and retention. But when it comes to enrollment planning at the Rochester campus, there are bigger questions to be addressed. What happens after 2020? How large will we grow? And how will we sustain our outcomes and innovation as we grow? To answer these questions, we've been engaging in extensive strategic planning, as the president mentioned, and a comprehensive analysis over the last several months. I have sought wisdom through dialogue with system experts and partners, industry community leaders, academic collaborators, faculty, staff, students, and alumni. And together, we've been asking, how can this innovative campus of the University of Minnesota best serve student learning, the university, public higher education as an enterprise in need of fresh models, 
And most importantly, how can this campus best serve the great state of Minnesota? One of the hallmarks of our state is that we are a community of problem <laughs> solvers. We think deeply about what needs to be done. We define feasible solutions, and then we commit to collective action in pursuit of a better future. UMR has drawn on that tradition to guide its strategic agenda for the next decade and beyond. At my inauguration in September, I asked that we look out from the top of the highest bluff in southeastern Minnesota to be inspired by the beautiful view in the distance and then climb back down and do the hard work of designing the next stage of the journey to move us in the direction of that inspiring view. What we seek are actions that will meet Minnesotans' needs while simultaneously drawing on the unique attributes of our trailblazing campus. One of those Minnesota challenges is the need to accelerate the development of the state's healthcare workforce. No less important is the challenge of satisfying the educational aspirations of all Minnesotans, including those that now, as in the past, have been underrepresented on our college campuses. We would be amiss not to point out that UMR understands well these challenges. We are a campus focused on healthcare. We have proved remarkably adept at recruiting and graduating a diverse student body. And we serve as a principal center of educational innovation for the university as a whole. What we lack as a brand new startup is scale. And that is precisely the challenge our next strategic enrollment plan addresses. Let us first acknowledge that Minnesota's healthcare workforce demands are accelerating exponentially. While this demand is widely known, one clear projection illustrates the growing need for educated healthcare professionals over the next six or seven years. The Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development identifies 28 healthcare occupations that require at least an undergraduate degree that are projected to grow by at least 10%. Many are growing even faster than that, and you can see the details in your docket materials. This growth means over 92,000 job openings in Minnesota for new positions that not only require an undergrad degree, but also pay enough for a family to live with stability in Minnesota. I'm grateful to Mark Schultz at DEED for these official State of Minnesota healthcare workforce projections. At the same time as healthcare workforce needs are accelerating, Minnesota's high school graduates are becoming increasingly diverse and are projected to decline in number, a national trend as well. These first two points are different sides of the same coin. It's going to take new ideas to meet the incredible healthcare workforce demand. One of the triumphs of our state is that in many arenas, we lead the nation in the quality of our education. However, as a state, sadly, we cannot make that claim for students from all backgrounds. UMR has proved to be a notable exception. The innovative Rochester campus is uniquely qualified to be a significant part of the solution. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can meet the demand for 92,000 new grads in the next year, uh, but we can contribute to the educated workforce and make another significant contribution. By launching a new campus that is driven to discover how to fuel student success, the University of Minnesota is not only distinct in the Big Ten, it has set in motion the discovery of solutions to systemic challenges like equity in achievement of education beyond high school, so vital to individual and collective thriving. As a result of our opportunity to focus on the quality of education, UMR can prepare a wider swath of the Minnesota student population and, importantly, we can discern and share the practices that are fueling increased inclusion and success. Not only are we innovative in education, UMR is also structured for long-term facilities efficiency and stewardship through public-private partnership. We are located in a growing Minnesota city that has invested in the long-term vision for this campus by supporting the purchase of property with city sales tax dollars 
so unusual, so wonderful. We are really grateful for our supportive, vibrant context, including support for this plan from the City of Rochester and the Destination Medical Center Economic Development Initiative. And we are seeking strategic connections with healthcare partners throughout the state, including the largest private employer in Minnesota, Mayo Clinic. The University of Minnesota and the healthcare industry can address the state's healthcare workforce demand in part by investing in bold enrollment growth on the Rochester campus. It is our aim that these will be students that are new to the U, not a siphoning of students from other campuses. As they do now, these additional students will come from all kinds of backgrounds, rural, urban, new American, first generation, and more. Currently, many capable Minnesotans start but do not make it through the undergraduate portion of their education, which creates difficulties for them and for all of us. One of the many consequences, critical healthcare careers that require graduate or professional education are not accessible to them. High demand careers such as addiction counselors and rural family practitioners. In many ways, the pipeline between higher education and the healthcare industry is clogged. We need to roll up our sleeves and go to work. At UMR, we've done just that, using evidence to guide practice. And now after 10 years, we know what to do and how to do it. Together, we can advance a series of key programmatic initiatives and collaborative partnerships that scale the Rochester campus, leverage existing system assets efficiently, contribute to the strength of the University of Minnesota, sustain success for more students, and unclog that pipe. What I know down deep is that we can do this and sustain the intimacy and innovation that got us started. How will we accomplish this enrollment growth? Well, first, we will expand undergraduate career pathways in these six key high demand areas, identified through an analysis of UMR alumni and affirmed by industry partners. Our efficient curriculum with a customized senior year makes this type of expansion feasible without adding multiple majors or minors. I know this approach to growth is different. Regents, I want to be sure you know it's different on purpose. The Rochester campus is designed to drive creative solutions. So rather than replicating the traditional practice of adding more and more majors and minors, we seek to be a future-focused campus, continuously adapting an efficient curriculum to produce graduates with core competencies linked directly to the rapidly changing needs of the workforce and culture. Then, through partnerships, we will create a University of Minnesota clear path for advanced study in high demand healthcare careers, leveraging existing university programs as well as smart new partnerships. In Rochester, the market for post-baccalaureate healthcare students is strong. One of the reasons senior leaders at Mayo affirm this plan. The established Rochester located nursing and bioinformatics programs are examples of this type of academic cooperation. Movement towards such endeavors is already in progress as we seek to create clear paths to meet Minnesota's need for public health administrators, physician assistants, integrative nurse practitioners, health coaches, mental health counselors, health analytics specialists, and more. And I'm very grateful to our current collaborators as well as emerging partners that will enable us to leverage the assets we have, including those under the purview of Dr. Toller, so grateful for his support, Dean Delaney, a long-standing partnership with the College of Nursing, Dr. Kreitzer at the Early Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing, Dean Finnegan, and Chancellors Black, Bear, and Holtz Claus. <coughs> Third, with industry partners, we will launch a fresh funding option for undergraduate education, Invest in Success. 
With this model, the healthcare industry invests in the development of human potential, providing a direct connection between supply and demand. Invest in success industry partners from across the state will have the opportunity to fund students' undergraduate education in exchange for employment with conditions specific to the partner's needs and the student's potential. I'm grateful to the Office of General Counsel for their continued support as we work to develop and implement this pilot. And finally, we will expand our influence on quality and innovation in higher ed, connecting researchers from across all five campuses, publishing results, convening thought leaders, and creating professional development experiences for higher ed innovators. Such leadership has already begun with 30 institutions from across the country participating in the first Higher Ed Innovation Summit at UMR this past June. Higher education needs innovation leaders. And if through the work of the Rochester campus, the University of Minnesota can identify the educational practices that close the achievement gap for undergraduates while simultaneously creating clear paths to address high demand workforce needs, it is realistic to expect that we in Minnesota can lead the country as innovation influence leaders in higher education. As we look beyond the current enrollment plan, we know that scaling UMR is possible. Growth at UMR will require investment, seed money, and that investment will be good for the university, the healthcare industry, and Minnesota. We are asking to begin the journey into UMR's second decade with bold enrollment growth, aiming first for 1,000 students and then moving toward an even bolder 1,500. In the boldest, longer range view, if we squint and look far out, we predict that Rochester can eventually sustain a campus of 2,500 students. At any rate, it's time to get started. Minnesota needs us to do more. After all the analysis and all the input, I wanna be crystal clear about what I see that we need to get started on the next decade of growth. First, to bring in larger first-year classes, we need to jumpstart the funding of four-year scholarships. One special challenge of a startup campus is that with six classes graduated, most alumni are still in graduate or professional school and <coughs> haven't reached the age of 30. <laughs> we also need to expand recruitment strategically and select new high schools. And we need to hire essential additional personnel. We're very lean in Rochester, so virtually everyone at Rochester is essential. But by essential, I mean, I am promising you, we will not use new dollars to become top heavy. These are individuals who will work directly with recruiting and with educating students. And the time has come, if we are going to scale the number of students at UMR, we will need additional space. And whatever space we occupy, we intend to continue our P3 commitment, pursuing partnerships that work in concert with the growth in our vibrant city. Link will provide some more details. <laughs> um, uh, within your docket material, there is some detail around uh, uh, both the three scenarios that uh, Chancellor Carroll has talked about, the bold, boulder, and boldest plan, as well as a year-by-year uh, look at that bold plan. Um, just for some highlights, the plan does contemplate um, and funds a modest set of four-year scholarships, uh, recruitment scholarships for UMR. UMR currently has zero four-year scholarships to offer. Uh, and uh, the old, as uh, Lori mentioned, the oldest alumni is likely to uh, right around 30 years old. Uh, so jump, some jump starting of that while we work on uh, uh, more creative uh, foundation and development opportunities, private co corporations, foundations, partnerships uh, will need to uh, be established. Uh, UMR uh, recently hired their first development officer going through training uh, next month. Uh, but to give you a sense, if we were gonna try to endow just 30 four-year scholarships of $4,000, which is going to be kind of a mid-range scholarship. Now, that requires a $10 million endowment. So we're gonna to have to be creative and do some annual giving things and some uh, private partnership 
ideas. Uh, the plan does uh, allow for two additional recruiters, uh, going all the way up to six, I think, uh, and additional uh, recruitment materials and technologies. Uh, the UMR educational model does not lend itself to just filling a recruitment funnel. They really have to be much more surgical and strategic. They have to find the five uh, high school students in every high school that actually are really passionate about healthcare education. Uh, beyond the recruiters, uh, this, this plan does allow for uh, very modest uh, academic hiring. Uh, we're talking about uh, student growth in the 40% range. Uh, we are not growing the staff by 40%, I can guarantee you that. Um, and all of the hires are contemplated to be student-facing hires. Uh, another thing that Rochester has done very well since its history is always leverage the system resources where possible. Uh, none of the anticipated hires will be of, of an administrative nature in Rochester. Um, finally, uh, you, you do have some uh, pages in your docket, uh, pages 14 through 17, dealing with uh, uh, the faculty space and additional uh, residence hall space. Uh, the Payne building referenced in your document is space UMR is currently leasing primarily for faculty space and some collaborative space. The UMR lease for that space expires in 2021. Uh, the owner of that building intends to take it down for uh, higher and better use. Uh, so we will have to find uh, space, uh, replacement space for the faculty uh, within the near term. Uh, the bold plan uh, would also fully fill the current residence hall at 318 Commons, uh, providing only a very m modest number of beds for sophomores and beyond. However, we are currently not meeting the chancellor's vision or research-based ba best practices by not providing uh, significant opportunities for second-year students to live in university-controlled housing, um, often with continuations of in living and learning communities. Uh, we're also finding that in an accelerating downtown market in Rochester, it'll be difficult for our students and families to find affordable housing uh, near our academic centers without some uh, intervention from the university. And obviously there uh, are potential advantages for considering both of these facility requirements simultaneously, especially as we assume the continuation of public-private partnership strategies to solve as many of these space needs as possible. Um, finally, in terms of creating efficiencies, uh, the plan does require UMR to continue to maximize the use of current existing academic space and the bold plan does not anticipate needing additional classroom or lab space at this time. Uh, an important part of the, of the expansion is uh, an expansion of the professional and graduate uh, partnership programs, we've been calling them PGP programs. Again, in the spirit of leveraging the system resources, the PGP programs are not new or duplicative full-time programs, but rather contemplates leveraging existing post-baccalaureate uh, degree and certificate programs from elsewhere in the system, repackage them in innovative evening, weekend, and executive pro program tracks, and that allows the campus to maximize the use of their current uh, existing academic footprint while minimizing the need for additional headcount personnel. Uh, finally, this plan does require the investment of some one-time resources to jumpstart both the recruitment strategy and to pre-hire, usually by one year, uh, any of the needed academic personnel before student growth occurs. It also requires uh, investments to keep up with inflationary or core costs like we talked about th this morning. Uh, however, the bold plan does not require uh, investment of extraordinary additional recurring state resources. Growth will be funded primarily through tuition revenue generated by additional students. Thank you, Link. So your innovative Rochester campus is producing phenomenal graduates and I know that our students and our graduates make you proud. They very much make me proud. And I've pictured our two of these young people, Mason Schlieff, a UMR junior from rural Minnesota and future nurse practitioner committed to the mental health needs of underserved populations. Um, Mason is also a student representative to the board. <laughs> also pictured is Mohammed Adani, a Minnesotan, a new American and a recent UMR grad working as a researcher at Mayo and produce, pursuing an MD-PhD as he 
continues to serve the local Somali com community. I am convinced that the human potential of young people from all kinds of backgrounds, coupled with Minnesota's healthcare workforce demand, makes UMR enrollment growth a responsible investment. You have my word that we will be superb stewards of that investment. As we look out from the top of the highest bluff in our region, the view is breathtaking. In the distance, we see a thriving campus characterized by the distinctiveness and quality we have established in our first decade. Rich conversation has led us to this presentation, and I'm excited to hear your questions and even more enthused for all of us to take this collective journey of growth. Thank you both. Uh, I'll first turn and ask if uh, our famous person who's sitting at the <laughs> dais has any comments. Student Representative Schlieff. Uh, thank you, Regent Omari. Um, this is just a really um, Im impactful just opportunity to be able to sit on this board um, for this moment because UMR has made incredible impacts on my life and my perspectives. Uh, for example, um, I do come from an underrepresented background on our campus, so I am from rural Minnesota, um, as Regent Anderson uh, is aware, by the Alexandria. Um, and then also I've had the opportunity of being a part of one of the living learning communities on campus, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, they have really changed my life. Um, and that has kind of inspired me um, in my uh, train of my career in wanting to pursue some place in an uh, underrepresented area. And I think that's something that's very special about our university, that a lot of our students have similar experiences like that, and it drives them to impact others like ourselves and continue uh, this growth in Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you. If this were an action item, I'm pretty sure it'd be a 12-0 vote. <laughs> Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, Two questions, so I'll, one of them I think is pretty simple and the other one hopefully so with the chair's indulgence, I'll ask the first one. So I'm looking at slide 31 and in the, that's the six bubbles there with the various areas that uh, you're looking for expansion and I'm always thinking as we talk about expanding and we did today with, with the College of Science and Engineering, but aligning what comes from our expansion with the needs of the state. And as I look at those six categories, Here's my simple question. When we were there last March, it's always good to connect our experiential opportunities with what's happening in this room. Um, some of us wandered off with a male physician and we went and saw, I think it was sonography and respiratory mm -hmm. therapy. Where's that fit? Is that under the far left bubble of patient care? And is that where that is? Or are those going away? Are they not getting expanded? What? No, they're not going away. Chair Omari, uh, Regent McMillan. Uh, the, these expansions are occurring primarily in our Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences degree, and the programs to which you refer are from our highly successful partnership with the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences, ah, okay. uh, the Bachelor of Science in Health Professions. I do think that we would characterize those as patient care, uh, but it is a direct entry into the workforce following graduation with a four-year degree and the certification that the, the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences programs provide that's embedded within that degree. So the, this expansion is primarily with the capstones um, and, and yet those programs would be characterized as direct patient care. Most helpful, thank you. Can I follow Please, up? Regent McMillan. So, uh, and again, in that theme of matching our research and education here, largely education, but also outreach and um, capabilities, you mentioned at some point in your remarks, Chancellor Carroll, that uh, you had done some vetting of this with providers and uh, the people who are delivering, you know, health care to the people of Minnesota. And I would expect there to be lots of alignment and input from, from mail, mm -hmm. your, your neighbor, your partner, you know, a symbiotic relationship we're lucky to have with them. But what about the rest of the state and the big metro systems and, you know, how much give and take is there there? Are you thinking about, I'm sure you are, but can you give me some sense of uh, what is the rest of Minnesota, you know, how are we aligning with what they need and your role in providing it? Yes, Chair Chancellor Omari Chair. and Regent McMillan. Indeed, uh, the Mayo Clinic Health Systems does uh, 
serve many parts of the state in addition to having such a large presence in Rochester, but we do have conversations with other uh, healthcare industry providers, uh, and those are in progress. On the next slide where we talk about the clear paths and then the invest in success, uh, we are committed to uh, pursuing those partnerships with other enterprises and are engaging actively in the Medical Alley organization to be sure that we are connected with a variety of types of um, medical industry providers since our students will have such a, a wide array of opportunities when they graduate. So, yes. Thank you. Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari, and thanks, um, Chancellor Carroll. That was um, it's a very inspiring presentation. I think we're all grateful for kind of the human capital and human re that you're, you're building uh, at UMR, and it's nice to see a few bright faces in the presentation as well. It reminds us why we're here. Um, so having said all of that, I want to just jump a little bit to the numbers. Um, on I think it's page 14. There's a... There's a um, annual enrollment revenue investment requirements is the is the way to look at this that with the investments over the next several years um, we would sort of accumulate um, close a million dollar sort of net uh, net loss um, in 2021 and then and then it improves dramatically going going forward as the enrollment so there's a little bit of a Losses that we're going to have to absorb here as we as we build into um, uh, a more highly scaled institution. Yes, Chair Omari and Regent Powell, uh, what we're anticipating in terms of budget implications is as a, a one-time commitment, and you're you're looking at the numbers that uh, reveal the the nature of that commitment, uh, but not a recurring or ongoing cost once we reach our enrollment target. Link, do you have? Uh, Chair Omari, Regent Powell, yeah, I would just say that, that what you're seeing there is the jump starting of scholarships um, and some pre-hiring, maybe by only one year, uh, in anticipation of that, uh, of that student growth. The third thing I would say on there, it's on line 24 of the chart, you're looking at the pain replacement build out uh, number. Uh, one way that UMR has been successful in keeping their rental, their ongoing rental rates down is by providing the one-time money to do the build-out uh, rather than have the developers do that. And I think that will be a useful strategy uh, going forward as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, I think I told you when I visited your campus that when I first heard about it uh, 10 years ago, startup, I thought, why do we need it? It's this close to Twin Cities, and why do we need that added expense? But <clears throat> that visit really turned my turned me around. I think it's a very unique program. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> I like the interaction between the faculty and students. It's very special. I mean, that was very obvious when I was there. I like the internship and the research with mail. Uh, I, I like all of that. And, and, and uh, the other thing I really found unique is the integration of the some of the undergraduate requirements in the liberal arts with your science program. That, that's really, really special. And, and so just a couple of, uh, um, of comments or questions. <laughs> you mentioned that growth in, in enrollment I like what, uh, what we're just looking at this chart on page 11 or whatever it is. Uh, growth in en enrollment is going to be uh, funded by uh, fac uh, faculty space, funded by uh, growth in enrollment. Mm -hmm. I like that. I mean, I don't know why we don't look at that. Other universities have done it. I don't know why we don't look at that. This really looks good to me. But <clears throat> I guess my, main, my other question is, I agree wholeheartedly with you, the need for area health care. And it's going to be a growing thing. My generation is going to need a lot more help and, and uh, so on and so forth. But um, Minnesota State's also looking at that, and the community college is very hard. Do you see that as competition, and how are you going to, how are you going to uh, address that? Please, Chancellor Carroll. Chair Omari and Regent Simonson, thank you for those encouraging words. I. I think that all of us in higher education are working for common purposes and that we, we bring to the experience something unique 
uh, in the University of Minnesota. A part of that is our, our focus on research. And at UMR, we're a, a demonstration of applying research results to the process of education. And so if we look at the outcomes in terms of graduates uh, completing within four years at over 90%, we don't see those kinds of uh, results in, in the, the good education that occurs in the other system. Uh, it's, it's a it's different approach and different model, but I think our reliance on research, and uh, I'll show you a list of the high impact practices, which means they are data driven, research driven practices. I really wanted to get to this slide, so I just sort of worked it into that answer. But I, <laughs> well done. I knew you could do it. On the left side of the slide, you see nationally with lots of research uh, practices that are endorsed by the American Association of Colleges and Universities as retention fueling success practices. Note that UMR was privileged to organize from the beginning with all of these practices in place for 100% of the students. And this is unusual, and we're so <coughs> grateful to have been able to do that. On the right, you see the list of additional practices, and Mason mentioned the living learning communities that are seeing statistically significantly positive results as well. These are being <coughs> tested by our faculty and enjoyed by our students as well. So that research base, I think, is a distinguishing characteristic, Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chancellor Carroll. And we have two more in a very short amount of time, but I'm going to go to Regent Shu first and then Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair Omari. Thank you, Chancellor, and um, AVP Coulson. Um, I, I noticed on the sheet that, uh, the page 14 number sheet, uh, that so this year, this fall, we started with uh, 519 in terms of um, total undergraduates and uh, 169 new high school students. So can you give me an idea? I know we're kind of still in the middle of the process, but can you give me an idea of what the you know, projection looks like or what the actuals are for the commitments to start next fall? For next fall, uh, we're ahead of where we were last time this year. So we... We are strategic and, and cautious in our growth in that our students coming straight from high school need a place to lay their heads mm -hmm. and our beds are full. And so we want to meet our enrollment target. We expect to do so um, and we have a challenge. Thank you. Quickly, please. Oh, yep. Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, so if, we, if we're out of beds, um, and we're not, I mean, obviously that's the limiting factor that I'm hearing, um, that the bottleneck is really having enough space for students to live. Um, how are we, how are we going to address that going forward? Um, I know we have to, you know, increase uh, the number of beds in like fixed numbers. I don't know what the numbers are, but um, we have to add a certain amount at a time. So how is that going to work with, um, with your plan? Mr. Carroll? Chair Omari, Regent Shu. Uh, we've explored many options, and uh, with the assistance of Brian Burnett's team uh, in space planning and real estate, uh, we have looked seriously at the possibilities, and uh, those have included uh, the potential to take on long term leases with properties that are going up currently. However, the exploration has revealed that the price point for students would not be acceptable. And so we continue our exploration, but expect indeed to need a, you know, a, a, a P3 approach to the development of housing in the very near future. Thank you. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple um, remarks real quickly. This is. It's a great news story, and, and, and when you think about the university's unique mission, you know, what Rochester is doing and, and the high level at which it's doing it, it really exemplify, I think, how we differentiate the flagship um, system in the state. Um, you know, that doesn't come without caution. You know, and, and again, I'm, I'm sort of forged by the experience of 
of uh, evaluating campuses and making some major changes uh, you know, a couple decades ago and you know, and, and really recognizing that cost, of, you know, over time people still look at those objective facts. What, what is it per student on this campus versus this campus versus this campus? Mm -hmm. And so certainly anything we can do to assist in getting, getting uh, the, the campus to where it is, is closer to some of the peers I think would be very um, important. Uh, you know, not, not only um, for the system as a whole, but also even for the community of Rochester and, and everything mm -hmm. else. I, the other comment would be that, you know, the, the, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I think it, it bears mentioning putting our recruiting resources into Rochester is so critical because when you're not known, you're not known. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I've got a feeling that if you get into some communities uh, in the urban communities, in rural communities, and you, you know, sort of explain what you offer to students who would never have even known that you existed, I think you're going to, you know, I think you already are. Uh, reaping great results. So when we talk about the kind of money that we spend in recruiting, I really think that um, uh, scouring the state for the top students that are going to stay here, they know the climate, they've got connections here, they're going to stay here and, and work, particularly in the rural communities. Um, I think this is a really great opportunity for us to do that, as, uh, as we heard earlier. Um, and then the final thing is, and this is again come a bit of a historical perspective, when we were making the changes in the first district where we had, we discontinued a vocational ag program at, at Wasika and engaged in the partnership in, in Rochester, it was, as I stated when we were in Rochester, it was about Mayo and it was about IBM. And and, and obviously, coming back after 20 years uh, hiatus, it, it were very heavily focused on Mayo. But I understand there's still there's still some good stuff going on in the technology front in Rochester. Is that anything part of, are we able to, to still capture that, which was part of kind of the original concept? Is that a way of us also continuing to serve that community while also gaining some economies in the, in the, at the same time? Yes, Chair Omari and Regent Rocha, indeed there is a focus still in emerging technologies and that is one of our pathways, emerging technologies in healthcare. We currently have the bioinformatics program that is Rochester located and that is one of our creative partnerships that uh, is growing and that we expect to channel more students from the undergraduate program at UMR into that graduate professional program. Uh, that's one of the ways we're growing. But on my advisory and advocacy group, we do have uh, former um, leaders of IBM who are informing our conversation as we look at emerging technologies. We're, we're also you know, thinking about artificial intelligence and how we might create a, a capstone pathway uh, that supports students learning how to learn as those changes come upon us. And as to your other comments, I would just note that small as we are, uh, sustaining the kind of quality that we have is an exceptional outcome, but it should also be noted given the hard work of the founding chancellor and all of the faculty and staff and the support of the system finance office that our books are balanced. So for a relatively modest investment, uh, we can sustain the momentum that is the Rochester campus. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Carroll and Vice Pre Assistant Vice President Kelson. Next up, uh, members, we have uh, our update on the Twin Cities five-year enrollment plan, and our acting provost, McMaster, will join the front table there. Um, and so we will allow you to transition. Thanks. Also joining will be Associate Vice Provost Lingering Clark. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Omari and, and members mm -hmm. of the board. Uh, we're here to give our fourth uh, report, uh, Twin Cities Enrollment Plan Update, as, as uh, President Kaler alluded to. I did want to mention that in your mailboxes, we put a much larger document, which is the full plan. So if you get really excited about this, um, you can go and dig deeper uh, in that report that's in your mailboxes. So uh, to start off, I wanted to put up the diagram that I, I normally um, discuss uh, to start this conversation. And it, it simply shows the relationship as we talk about strategic enrollment management 
among the, the topics of tuition, financial aid, and then, and then the admission strategy. And basically, when you piece all of this together, um, you're talking about student success. And there's a very strong relationship. So as we talk about, for instance, tuition, um, there have been conversations and decisions made about NRNR over the last few years. I didn't know if you knew that or not. And that, that conversation on NRNR, uh, the increases led last year, and I, I, I can't pin it all to that, to a decrease in then enrollments uh, in that particular category. And it also resulted in a requirement uh, or, or, or a, a need to significantly increase as best we can the discounting and scholarshiping to those NRNR students. So that's an example of the very strong relationship among these three entities, and we could talk for hours about that. Chair Omari and members of the committee, I'm happy to be here. Uh, we thought we'd share a little bit about how the work gets done on the Twin Cities campus, and so we've provided the strategic enrollment management work workflow for you. And really this committee is uh, the group that drives the lovely long document that Bob was referencing, but the 10 strategic areas. And so the main committee of the Strategic Enrollment Management meets monthly to discuss how we move these different agendas forward. We involve, we, it involves data analysis, some discussion on student experiences, and exploration of possible interventions. And representation comes from Office of Undergraduate Education, Office for Student Affairs, Equity and Diversity, Collegiate Associate Deans, Housing and Residential Life, and International Student and Scholar Services. So we really try to have full representation. We have four standing committees that also meet monthly, a retention <clears throat> committee that is really designed to connect the work happening in a lot of different units to the central enrollment plan. We have a curriculum committee who, whose goal is really to address any bottlenecks or issues or topics related to the curriculum. The data committee are data analysts and survey and assessment folks from all over campus so we can bring that information together to support the work of the enrollment plan. And I know you've heard a lot about the Multicultural Student Success Committee and how they're supporting and addressing the diversity resolution. So these committees are meeting and working regularly. And we, of course, have the ability to have an ad hoc working committee to address uh, anything in a, in a short-term nature. So as a reminder, um, the framework for our enrollment plan uh, developed five years or so ago involved 10 areas. And I'm not gonna go through each one of these 10, but I did want to mention that as we go through this presentation, we're not doing a deep dive into all 10 of these this, this, uh, during the presentation. Um, we've selected a few that we think are most important this year, and the emphasis uh, likely varies year to year on these. Uh, again, as a reminder, uh, the plan calls for an increase uh, of the undergraduate enrollment to 32 to 33,000 students by 2024. Um, we, do, we do focus uh, the enrollment growth in several areas. One is STEM. We heard about that earlier today in terms of the likely increases in science and engineering, uh, in health, and then in environment. Uh, Interestingly, as you look at the data, we slid backwards slightly in terms of the overall enrollment on the Twin Cities campus, undergraduate enrollment, in large part due to the graduation rates. So the downside of better graduation rates is you're clearing students through the system uh, more quickly, and so um, we have to uh, account for that. We also wanted to make sure that we provided an update on the geodemographics. Again, this could be a, a long, long conversation, um, but this is a graph that gets updated on a regular basis. And there have been some adjustments since the last time you saw this, and I'll just point to one. Uh, in previous versions of this, the Northeast showed a fairly dramatic downtick in high school graduates. And in the newest data, that's leveled off quite a bit. I, why, I can't tell you, uh, but now the projections are that uh, Northeast enrollment, high school, excuse me, high school graduates would be fairly flat. Um, there is also a decrease in the number of graduates from the southern United States, from the southeast quadrant. That growth was supposed to be up around 7 or 8% in previous versions. What this tells us is these are very dynamic 
uh, uh, numbers and we have to stay on top of those year by year. The model for growth that we have is in front of you. Uh, again, it shows year by year in terms of the NHS freshman class, NAS transfer class, uh, how many students we would need to bring in um, to get up to that uh, 33,000. Um, this model, uh, which uh, might be considered a bit overly precise, would put us at 32,900. Um, I doubt that's exactly where we're going to be, but it gives us a guideline on the numbers we'll need to reach that particular uh, growth. Basically, for the next few years in the freshman class, the goal is to bring in 6,000 to 6,100 freshmen. The next slide is something new for you to look at. Uh, when we drill down a bit and get into the weeds, we sit down with each of the colleges every year and establish targets. Provost Hansen and I do this. And what you're looking at here for the seven freshmen admitting colleges uh, are the targets. The targets are in parentheses. Um, and you can see that there's both a single number in certain instances and a range in other instances. And the goal each year in the admissions process is to obviously hit that target as closely as possible. And so one of the things to note here is that for science and engineering, which is the third row in the table, the anticipated growth target for next fall is that 1250 that was discussed this morning. So these are a set of conversations that go on each year uh, related to numbers and metrics and diversity. And so this kind of scratches the surface of that. Uh, the, the graph you see every year showing the number of applications, the offers we make, and then the confirms, the enrollees, uh, one can see basically an upward trend uh, on, on both applications and offers, although one can note, as I think you well know, that over the last few years, the actual number of apps has been uh, coming down a bit. Um, you'd find that most of that downtick was in the NRNR category, whereas the maroon curve at the bottom shows a relatively flat uh, size of the freshman class. And speaking of the freshman class, um, I never really was able to provide an update as to what that class looked like. You can see the basic metrics for the class here. Uh, uh, we were just a few notes. In terms of Minnesota residents, we were up this year from about 62% to 65, nearly 66%. That's a number you look at carefully. Um, we, were, we were actually up a bit on reciprocity this year also. Um, we were down with NRNR from 16% to 12% of the class, also in terms of numbers. And you can see the ACT and the, the other metrics there. So the way we look at the freshman class is in a variety of categories. Um, this graph shows the number of Minnesota freshmen entering. This is a number you want to go up. It has been going up. Um, we're also very attentive to greater Minnesota. Um, the greater Minnesota numbers um, have been struggling a bit, um, but the actual percent is actually um, looking, uh, looking okay with, with greater Minnesota. Uh, looking at the, the next graph, student of color headcount. Um, we had the highest percent and the highest number of students of color uh, in recent history. If we look at um, first generation students, freshmen, this is a number that had been trending downward uh, and we saw an uptick in first generation freshmen last fall. In terms of Pell eligible students, uh, this is a number we, we obviously have uh, also watched carefully. You can see the trend that's fairly parallel with the economy. Uh, right after the recession, we saw the number and percent of Pell students go up considerably. When the economy started to improve in 2011, 2012, and since that point in time, um, you can see the downward trend for Pell. Um, this is still a number we look at carefully. We basically returned uh, to some pre-recession uh, levels here, but it's, it's a number that, again, uh, we don't want to see uh, probably drop anymore. Uh, and then 
Uh, some of the metrics, this is the average high school rank. Uh, again, I think we're going to see the average high school rank starts to start to level off now, uh, along with the next slide, which is ACT. We've, we've pretty much maxed out on the ACT, unless we wanted to pull all kinds of levers to raise it even more. Your goal is to maintain an ACT on the Twin Cities campus of 28 plus, uh, and so I think we will be able to do that. So moving on in terms of the, the um, parts of the, the plan, uh, one of the major pieces we have is to admit for success. We want to admit students who we're confident will graduate in a timely way. That means four years. Uh, and so the admissions process is critical in terms of the mission match of high school graduates to this institution. Uh, I do want to make the point, as I do every year, that there's significant variation in the ACT scores. Uh, not every student that enters this institution has an ACT score of 28.4. Um, that's pretty obvious and they vary significantly college by college. But related to the conversation this morning, you can see the, the excellence in CSE. Their average ACT now in that college is approaching 32. I should also mention that in their honors program within CSE, the average ACT is now 34 out of 36. So you don't want to apply to that program right now. Uh, you can also see that, you know, other colleges, there's variation. And so, for instance, in the College of Design, um, the, the middle quartile, uh, 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 or excuse me, middle range of ACT goes from 25 to 29 in design. What that means is that 25% of the students enter in with an ACT lower than 25. So, uh Admitting for success is really critical, but uh, many aspects of the plan are actually about supporting and retaining and graduating the students when they get here. So a lot of our work and conversations happen around those particular experiences. And so number four is high quality education and student experience, which is vast and varied for many of our students. And there's many, many opportunities, as you know, in and out of the classroom. Living on campus, connections with faculty and advisors, classroom experiences, to the many high impact practices and experiential opportunities, honors, research, learning abroad, you know of all of these. But it also is about policies and um, maybe uh, practices that could create bar barriers for our students and slow their progress. So a lot of these play a critical role when looking at our student success metrics. This slide is really, um, Eye-opening, I think in the last two decades, the Twin Cities has done a lot of work to advance these metrics. And this, these categories here do reflect a lot of the different things that have occurred on this campus that I think does contribute to those um, metrics. A couple of examples. Under uh, technology and tools, you may be familiar with our A-plus advising uh, support system tool. This is an enterprise-wide tool. It has a wealth of student information. It is used by advisors, career service folks, and student support areas. Uh, they have the ability to view student records, monitor academic progress, and update and view case notes on individual students. And so we continue to value A-plus as one of those critical tools that does support student success. So there's many examples on this list. Uh, Welcome Week, the curriculum, those types of things um, have evolved over time to kind of get us where we are today. If we take a look at what we're focusing on in the 2018-2019 year that supports kind of those 10 areas, this slide reflects a lot of those different topics that the Enrollment Management Committee has been focusing on. Uh, a couple of examples here. You may recall OUE did a presentation in June on gateway courses. And so there is a committee that has now been formed to take, to take a look at uh, the analyze that course data and the high uh, DFW rates, understand the impact of these courses on student degree progress, and identify those gaps and trends to enhance student success in those courses. Another quick example is the midterm alert committee. That was also part of that discussion. We want to increase the number of midterm alerts at the 1,000 level uh, courses. We want to improve communication, make it easier for faculty to uh, enter midterm alerts and automate those types of things. So these are um, 
examples of committees and the work and how we're bringing some of these strategic areas to life. Uh, another area that I just wanted to briefly highlight, we do a lot with retention efforts, and I've been involved in a four year, for four years on analyzing first year retention and trying to understand who's not re-enrolling in their first year. We finally call this the lever study. Um, and so, as you can see on this slide, uh, no single demographic predicts a student's risk of leaving. If we knew that, we'd, we'd have great retention. In fact, the compounding effects of these many characteristics really increase the risk of leaving. And some of these factors include, this should say living off campus, not on campus, living off campus, high school academic profile, first generation status, and where they're coming from. And so in our four years of this analysis, some higher level scenarios are that they take sort of two paths. They transfer to an institution in their home state, about 45% of them do that, or they discontinue college entirely, which is about 43%. Some of that does include students who take a leave of absence. Um, we also can take a look, go ahead, uh, take a look at using our A plus tool to understand reasons. Academic advisors have great relationships with students and they know the student narrative and stories around why students may not be enrolling. And we can leverage that data through the system and do an analysis of why students are leaving. And so what I would say here is that personal reasons are always at the top of the list followed by academic reasons. There are subcategories in each of these categories, but mental health continues to be the highest tag under personal reasons for our students as, as many of the reasons that they're leaving. Um, also on the transfer note there, students may not tell their academic advisor they're transferring. So that is 35% are tagged that way, but on the previous slide, 45% actually do transfer. So um, students don't always tell their academic advisors and folks like us everything. So we share this data with colleges and we discuss intervention strategies. Um, this is really just a snapshot of the work on how we're trying to understand the retention of our students uh, in the first year. Uh, acting, acting Provost uh, McMaster, I just want to, we're at number five and we're almost at the presentation time. Are yeah. you going to go through all 10 of these? We, we are not going through all 10. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Rest assured. Um, moving on, we uh, have a, one of our points is around maintaining commitment to transfer students. Uh, you realize we have a very high percentage of transfer students compared to our peers. Uh, this graph shows where our transfer students are coming from. Uh, each year we do an analysis uh, on these numbers. The numbers haven't changed, or the places haven't changed a great deal. Uh, what we have is we have a high percentage of community college students in that top 10 uh, transferring to the University of Minnesota. Uh, this particular pie chart uh, simply shows you the, the, the basic categories of transfer students. Again, the Minnesota State two-year represents 34% of our transfer students. And to reinforce the point that we run very high, um, this graph shows vis-a-vis, -vis, or compared to our peers in the Big Ten, that in the fall, these are fall transfers only. We add another 650 transfers in the spring to CLA, uh, it's about 28%. And for, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, skip we'll skip that. that, that's fine. Finally, to kind of finish up here, um, one of the major goals of the enrollment plan is to value ethnic, social, economic, and geographic diversity. And last December we came and there was a lengthy conversation around diversity and success of our students of color. So I'm not going to repeat all that here. This is one of the slides from December and, and uh, suffice it to say, there's a lot of attention paid, not only to the recruitment of students of color to, to add to our diversity, but also to ensure student success. These are your goals in terms of board metrics for retention and graduation rates. And uh, our first year retention hangs around 93%. Uh, Beth just talked about the, the factors in terms of why students leave. They don't come back for the second year. Our four-year graduation rate now is at uh, 71%. And this is probably one of the graphs that I'm most pleased to present to you. It shows the collective work of this institution, the board, the president, the provost, advisors, career counselors, faculty, and 
Uh, we have moved into the second place uh, among our Big Ten peers in terms of four-year graduation, but please note we have uh, a series of institutions that are nipping at our heels here, uh, and so we're going to have to continue to work hard. I don't really care whether we're second or not. I just think it shows that we're very competitive in terms of our graduation rates, and there's our six-year graduation rate. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll finish with this slide, which is, uh, and you're going to hear more about this later uh, today. We continue to focus on our need-based and merit-based aid programs. And in particular, we're concerned about this because indebtedness goes up with the number of years you spend at this institution. I didn't need to tell you that, but there is the actual graph that shows the impact of this. We'll stop there. Thank you, Acting Provost and Associate Vice Provost. Uh, I already have quite a few regents who would like to comment, so we'll start with Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Regent Amari. Uh, great presentation. Uh, interesting to me as I'm going through, and I, I, uh, I don't want to take long here, but I'm just going to point out something. Um, you have the four-year, five-year, six-year graduation rate, and one of the things you mentioned early on was that um, we had less students basically because of faster graduation. I understand that, and, and I can see this happening from a financial point of view with, with parents and their students looking at this. <clears throat> we are growing, ever increasing, a three-year graduation rate, are we not? Yes, we are. So, so, so my question kind of comes on, uh, I have never seen a data point on this, but I think it might be interesting how much revenue we get in the life of a student. And my guess is that is going to go down because... Many of them are, well, a couple things. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you is within the last month, I picked up a Kiplinger magazine. On the cover, it said, How to Save Money at College. And so I started to look at it, and the author who wrote it was a uh, person from Illinois, and the student was at the University of Minnesota. And they were talking about, you know, stay under the banded credit so you don't have to pay the full tuition, take some state university classes online so you can still get your 16 credits, my point is they were figuring out, I think the public is getting smarter at this, yeah. figuring out how to get college at a lower cost. So my point being, we need to look in the future with these three-year graduation rates, what we are getting revenue per student, because we also have, even for Minnesota kids, the PSEO, concurrent enrollment, many of the schools are getting in uh, so that our, our kids, our students can get out of here in three years, take on less debt, less tuition. And I guess that is just the presumption for a question I have. Do you see that type of thing changing? And also, you know, I look at it operating the finance committee, how getting three years of tuition from a student is a lot different than getting four years of tuition yeah. and how what it does to us. Yeah. So have you looked at revenue per student or are those things that fall into your uh, thought process? Acting Provost. Yes, uh, Chair Omari, uh, Regent Anderson. We, we have not looked at the revenue per student, but apropos to your question, we, we consistently see the number of dual credits going up for students. We see the graduation rates improving. Um, we see the three-year graduation rate going up. I think it's about uh, five plus percent now. Uh, you'd have to standardize the data, of course, if you want to look at um, um, cost over their, their um, uh, time here compared to other students because the tuition rates are going up as well. Um, but my sense is if you did that standardization, you probably would see on average um, uh, um, that number going down. Thank you. Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Amari. Uh, just one point for clarification. I, when you showed, I can't find the chart here on the excuse me, the growth over time of students, and you mentioned the College of Science and Engineering, you showed the 100 that we talked about this morning. Right. Was that in 2020? Um, yeah, uh, Chair Omari and Regent Simonson, the, that number would be for the class entering in 2019. Okay, so we talked about the need for infrastructure and faculty to meet that need. I, I don't connect them. We, we, we voted to increase certain things because yeah. they needed to do this, and now we're going to have it. And I don't think we're going to have that increase in in space. And yeah. by then, are we? There, the the College of Science and Engineering, and I don't want to speak for them in terms of space needs. Um, I think uh, Vice President um, Burnett would have to do that. 
but there, there is a bit of flex right now in their system so that we can get some additional students in okay. through chemistry, for instance. We do that by saying to students, if you don't have to have chemistry in the first semester, we're going to hold you off to the second semester when the demand tends to be less. And um, making the class sizes a little larger, not to the point where we're deteriorating the quality of the education. So they can get started on this project, they just can't continue this project. Okay. Because if you roll it out, you take that 100 students over four years, you basically are adding over that period 1,200 students. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, real quick one. Um, um, we also talk a lot on the Twin Cities campus as far as ACT. And, and uh, you know, one thing, I look at the University of Minnesota as one university, five campuses. <clears throat> and I wonder if that's really an attraction to be talking about that. And I know personally in my own family, <clears throat> excuse me, my two oldest were in the 30s. And my daughter comes in with a 24 and she says, it's good you didn't have any more kids. And yet today she's got a, a PhD in doing a postdoc. Sure. Okay. Um, that's a, that's a good question, Regent Simonson. I, I'll remind you that the 28 is a board metric, so one of the reasons we talk about it is that uh, the board is interested in that number. Um, but it, it is a number that we use to compare ourselves with institutions nationally. Uh, and and it also is a, is a measure, uh, along with many other measures, of the quality of the freshman class, along with high school rank, along with grades, along with all the other experiences but it's the one number that you can use to compare a student here with a student from California and Florida and Texas and New York. And Crookston and, and, and Morris as well? Sure. Okay, real quickly, you know, I liked what uh, that graph on page 11 that Roger UMR had. I think that's really nice with the metrics and the plan and laying that out. I would really like to see something like that. Sure. For the Twin Cities campus. Great, good. Thank you. That ACT conversation is getting the national rankings too, and unless we're going to get out of the rankings game, we're probably going to be talking about ACT. So that's a debate that we'll have to have as a board. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot here, right? There's just a lot here, and and uh, appreciate this opportunity, and hopefully we'll have some more um, because I think this is going to be a pretty substantial part of the strategic planning process going forward. Because where we end up here. And, and which colleges people are admitted to, and I mean, it's going to drive a lot. We can we just saw with our our uh, Rochester campus facilities how that's constraining our capacity to, to to meet enrollment numbers and so on. So I hope that I hope that uh, we get plenty of opportunities to talk about this. I want to touch on a couple of things. You know, I, I still I, I look at our enrollment percentages, and and it's you know still when when I reengage the university and some of the data and the, and the metrics, I was I was really surprised. That we were over a third non-resident, you know, non-resident students. That the resident students made up less than two thirds of the of the student population among undergrads, particularly because we went from a time when all Minnesota high school students could be admitted, just not necessarily to a degree granting school. And so you can imagine how that changes the perspective of the community from an asset available to everybody to an asset that is available to fewer and fewer. Um, and I think that if you talk to whether it's legislators or just people on the street. They're, they're, they're surprised if you say, what percentage do you think are Minnesota students? And I've, I've yet to have anybody um, you know, guess something in the range that, that we are. They, people expect it to be a higher number than that. But one of the things I think that we can maybe take a look at uh, going forward and as we go into this, this uh, strategic planning process, I'd like to um, explore as, as other institutions uh, have, have been doing or look, have, have moved into, is rather than fixating on the percentage of total undergraduate students, start talking about a number. That you know, we, we know we have a, a fairly close idea about what's gonna come out of the high schools. And if we establish a number that really, you know, is really more reflective of the graduates coming out of the state as opposed to a number compared to who we admit from other areas, I think it's a little more predictable. And I think it also tends to let you move into a bit, of a, a bit more of a market-based assessment of your non-residents um, because as far as I'm concerned I'm not really so concerned that we're letting X number of students in from Illinois or Missouri or, or, or uh, Nevada it's it's much more our Minnesota students having access and so if Minnesota students you know generally have access I, I don't I have no quarrel with students from other parts of the world and uh, parts of the country provided that it, you know it's it's a market-based you know process and we're not diminishing the quality of the pro, uh, of the experience for 
uh, for, for Minnesota students, and I think we know that students from outside of the state actually enhance the experience, you know, subject to scarcity of space and, and housing and so on. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to figure out if we can start looking at that at some point um, as, as to coming up with, with that kind of a number. We saw, again, the graph, as, as you know, uh, Provost McMaster, not my favorite, which is the one that shows the regional expectations because the Midwest is heading in a different direction than the state of Minnesota. Uh, just looking up the Office of Higher Education, Minnesota from 11 to 25, I know that we're kind of in the midpoint or past the midpoint now, is a 7.8% increase, and, and we're still expecting to have growth over about the next 15 years, at least as far as the projections go. So Minnesota still is growing in the number of, of students. But within that, one of the areas, of, I think, of disappointment, um, we've, we've made progress, but if I'm not mistaken, I hope I have my data right, but we're sitting something around 24% students of color yeah. Uh, but our high schools are producing almost a, around a third of, of the high school graduates. Uh, is, so. that's, that's what I thought. What, what are you seeing as far as the state number? About that same number, 24 to 25% statewide. As I, I, I'll have to check my data again because I, I was pulling it up trying to see, well, where are we as a state? And, it, and it's, maybe this is a projection uh, of, so. or maybe it's an enrollment as opposed to a graduation because of the achievement gap. Yeah. But, but at that point, I think, you know, we do have to kind of look at where we are heading as well as where we are. So um, I'm hopeful that we'll be, we'll, we'll be successful with respect to that. Um, and then finally, talking about the ACTs, I, I, I just I want to make sure that we're real clear about the data. Um, I, at some point, I'd like to have a conversation about where the, we talk about this commitment to transfer students. Um, I understand, you know, I was part of the, 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 the conversation where we created the 2 plus 2 program where we, we aligned our, our programs with the community colleges and other schools so that you weren't finishing with a, a, uh, a four-credit uh, uh, economics class at another state school and then coming here in that class is five credits, so you have to take it over again. We, got, we, we did a lot of work to make that work, but I don't ever remember it being that we had to reserve freshman slots for transfer students, and I would actually suggest that we have some, some of our colleges do have those slots and some of them are full enrollment of freshmen, you know, particularly those with the higher ACTs. And so when we talk about our ACTs, because as you pointed out, we have one of the highest transfer rates among our peers, transfer students' ACTs don't count um, against that data. So it, to some extent, it, it, it comes off as a little bit misleading if, as far as where you're going out to attract these students. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about the ACTs, we talk about the NRNR, and we're down in, in the student, in, in the enrollment, but our, but our ACT is up. Well, what would that enrollment be if we had admitted in a way that left it flat? So, I mean, if there's a price to be paid for that increase, um, perhaps in the enrollment, and, you know, if we had, because we certainly didn't admit every non-resident who applied. So if we had admitted more, we would have hit the same number, but it would have had an impact on the ACT. Our ACT went up, so there's a price to be paid for that. Um, and I think we need to be mindful of that as we go forward. But I, this, is, this is very helpful to, to look at this, and, and uh, I hope the conversation continues. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I think we're going to have to have like an eight-hour strategic planning session on enrollment alone uh, at some point. So uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, come summertime maybe, uh, y'all might want to take that up. Uh, and Mr. Vice Chair, Kim Powell, it's on you. Thank you, Chair, uh, Chair Amari. So, Anyway, very, it's a really a good presentation, lots of data, very interesting. You can get lost in it. So I, my question is on five, on transfer students, <laughs> still learning. And so I was, I didn't realize the numbers are so high, and which is, which is good, um, re, uh, really good, very, very positive. Um, but then I also noticed, again, if I had the data right, that um, the, the, the three-year graduation uh, after you know admitting being admitted as I guess a third year student the metric is some um, percent graduating at, after three years Correct. so and that's that's pretty low I think compared to 62 percent I think was the number which I, I found um, you know s s somehow troubling you know given just the importance of that group of students and so and so the question is should should I I mean or, I mean or is there something there maybe that we could should be focusing on and working on just to help those students a higher percentage of them succeed for all you know for a bunch of reasons but they're I mean they're just such an important part of the of the institution and they bring a lot and I would have thought 
you know, two years at a junior college, you're a little more mature, a little more focused. I would have guessed that they would do as well or better. So I was, I was surprised by that outcome. Yeah. Sure. Acting Provost McMaster. Yeah, Chair O'Murray and um, Regent Powell, uh, you're correct that the, the three-year uh, uh, goal is 65%, and we were approaching that a year ago. We were at 64 point something, and it slid backwards. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing, and I think I mentioned this at some point in time, and as an aside, I think we're coming back in May with, a, with an entire presentation on transfer students. Um, but one of the things we're seeing is a softening of the transfer pool. Um, we're not getting the same number of applications. Uh, in part, it's because of Minnesota State and their enrollment issues. In, in part, it's because of their enrollment issues. In, in part, it's because they're establishing very tight two-year to four-year programs uh, to make sure that they're not losing their students to the University of Minnesota. Uh, that said, uh, it, it, it is troubling, and we've known for years that transfer students don't have the same kind of experience here that freshmen do because of all the first-year programming, second-year programming, uh, sense of, of camaraderie and belonging to the campus. Transfer students very often are, are traveling uh, longer distances to get here. But I'm going to ask um, Associate uh, Vice, Vice Provost Lingren Clark to, to comment on that also because she oversees our transfer unit. Yes, Chair Omari and Regent Powell. Uh, the students, transfer student success strategy, we've been working on how to better support and serve transfer students probably for the 13 years that I've been here. And I would say that they come with lots of varied experiences. Um, some students come from a four-year institution where they thought that they wanted to start their collegiate career and then they transfer here mid-year. And that's a very different experience than a student who graduates with an associate's degree and then comes to the University of Minnesota to, to, to complete that. So I think the challenge in supporting those students is they do have varied and unique needs and have different expectations. Some students want to get to know peers and that's what engagement is. And other students' engagement is with faculty and I want to do research. And so I think that's something we've been grappling with over the last decade since we've been supporting transfer students. Um, we've been doing a lot of different things to support transfer students. We have a transfer student network where transfer students can go to coffee with another transfer student. We're trying to provide that more one-to-one -one so they don't feel like they're lost in the shuffle. Uh, last year we had Welcome Week for the first time for transfer students. We had a smaller scaled back version of that program, but this was the first time they could be in that giant picture in the M on the football field and they had a college day and they had um, lots of other things to make them feel valued and connected in their colleges. And so um, I think the ongoing challenge is there's always more focus on the first year students always, I feel like. And so sometimes transfer students, I hate to say this out loud, become an afterthought in some people's minds. And so being a transfer advocate, getting people to think about transfers just as much as they think about first years is also an important part about educating our campus on who our transfer students are. And we launched a training program this fall for faculty and staff. So I, I do think it is a challenge. I do think they have varied experiences, which makes it more challenging, but there's a lot of people committed here on this campus and doing work to support transfer students. Thank you. Yeah. Colleagues, uh, we're gonna try to move through the last four of us uh, fairly quickly. Regent Cohen, please. Uh, did uh, Acting Provo Vice Pro uh, Provost McMaster have something to say? <laughs> I thought oh, so. did I miss you? I thought so. Oh, thank you, I did. Uh, <laughs> 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 Cheryl Omari and Regent Powell. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on for the last two years is an intensive data analysis on transfer students. So the question I asked my group is, do we know if a student comes here from Normandale uh, in biology, how they're doing at this institution versus a student with a 3 uh, versus a student who comes here from MCTC into biology with a 2-5. We have a massive data set now that's been put together. Peter Radcliffe is doing some of this work. And so when we come back in May, I think we're going to have some very interesting findings on the successful and non-successful paths from these institutions into the Twin Cities.
Good, thank you. That, that's going to be very helpful, and I caution us, though, because then if we see that, you know, the I, I did PSEO at Normandale, so I'll pick on Normandale. The Normandale students are not tending to do as well as we do admissions with transfer students. We need to make sure that we're not just looking at Normandale and saying, oh, they're not doing so well, scrap them. That's typically what we do with University of Wisconsin transfers. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but other folks. We do that uh, already. <laughs> so just want to throw that out there. Regent Cohen. Thanks, Chair <coughs> Omari. Um, first of all, I want to say kudos to all of us and any of us who have had any hand in getting that graduation rate up for four-year four year graduation up above 70 percent, because I know that that was a really important goal of the board, and it has it's really it was very very much lower years ago, and to have that rate up there, I think everybody ought to. Uh, take a, a bow. So thank you for all you've done in that. Um, I'm not going to talk about ACTs. I'm going to call, talk about or ask about class rank. I know that a lot of high schools don't give class ranks anymore uh, because it's not helpful to their students. Uh, does that does that present a problem for us? That's my first question. And the second one was about the midterm alerts, and that is. Um, to whom, by whom, and um, do they ever happen before midterm if there's if something is uh, important or somebody's struggling, so they sh there should be some sort of alert before midterm? Okay. I think Provost McMaster. Yeah, um, Chair Omari and Regent Cohen, I'm gonna take the high school rank and then I'll ask Beth to um, take the second question because she's engaged with that uh, much more intensively than I am. In terms of the high school rank, you're spot on. Um, it's especially the suburban schools that have migrated away from the use of high school rank. About 55% of schools actually report rank, and that's going down. Uh, and so as we look at, again, the, the admissions information that comes in, in terms of the primary characteristics, you have high school rank, you have GPA. Most of the GPAs for the students are clustered up 3, 7, 3, 8, 3, you're, you're often splitting hairs. We have ACT, we have rigor of the curriculum, but it has created a problem that so many schools don't report rank um, um, to us. Associate Vice Provost. Uh, Chair Omari and Regent Cohen, thank you for your question. Uh, the, the, co the goal of the Midterm Alert Committee is to increase actual midterm alerts and what faculty are providing, but I wasn't able to cover um, a uh, part of A plus that we can leverage, which is called retention tagging. And this allows folks who have access to that system, if they have an interaction with a student that is alarming or a little bit concerning, they can apply what's called a retention risk tag. And a year ago, we looked at those from fall to spring, and over more than half of the students who had that tag left and did not re-enroll in the spring semester. So this fall, we deployed sort of a pilot um, where we have a small group of folks who are actually pulling those reports weekly and trying to do additional intervention that's supporting what the academic advisor is doing for that student. And as you can imagine, most times these are not about academics. These are about personal things. The specific tags they look at is a lack of uh, community of friends, doesn't feel welcome, um, want to be closer to home, you know, those types of things. And so sometimes the academic advisor may not be as positioned to think about the many resources that we have here on campus. So we have folks from Housing and Residential Life, the Office of Undergraduate Education, Student Affairs, who come together to try to circle around individual students one at a time to reach out to them. So that's an example of how that would complement a midterm alert. Thank, Thank you. you. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, your this is a five-year plan. You're working the plan. You're making progress in the plan. And um, this particular plan tries to balance about as many priorities as you can imagine. And so I, pre you know, we all appreciate uh, that the um, all the plans we have roll up, all the roads cross into the progress card. I mean, this this plan is a data-driven plan. And the key data drivers show up in the progress card. So I want to make sure as people um, look at elements of this plan, they're thinking about the repercussions on the other parts of the, the progress card. So if we, we lower access requirements, or we increase access by lowering ACT, we're going to decrease graduation. 
we're going to increase student debt, and we're going to add millions of dollars onto operating costs here because of the jam up of people and the the need for more um, assistance. So my point is, as we go forward to the strategic plan, we better look at everything at the same time because one thing is it just impacts the other. Absolutely spot on, Regent Beeson, um, and we'll have to decide as a board whether or not we want to uh, provide the resources that people might need to be successful if we were to tweak some of those numbers in conjunction with the, the scorecard. Um, so thank you for, for pointing that out. Regent Shu and then Regent Swigum, and you, you will be off the hot seat, but I think you still might have some more. So uh, Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Omari. Thank you, presenters. Um, I know I don't have much time here, but uh, I did want to talk about um, capacity. Uh, I know we don't really generally think of what our real capacity is, um, but I think we need to think about that in terms of the planning for the future. Uh, what, we, what we don't think about typically is the fact that we tend to trade off um, dollars and students, uh, revenue dollars in the form of tuition from students who we don't, uh, don't admit because we're either trying to maintain a 28.4 ACT or for some other reason. And um, all I can think of is the fact that, you know, we can't set one priority over the other. We have to look at the whole thing. Because I think when we set the 28 ACT, I, was, I think it was before I was on the board, actually, I don't think anyone ever talked about how much revenue we might be giving up by not admitting students who would drop that down. And so... You know, CFANS uh, was, is a college that we know is um, uh, not up to capacity, not even up to their target. And we, I've talked about this before, but I think we really need to figure out how to fix that problem because if you look at where our students, where other students, um, what our com competition is for Twin Cities, um, it's UW-Madison, it's St. Thomas, Duluth, uh, Iowa State, St. Olaf the top five, and then number six is NDSU. But the question really is, you know, it, what this tells me is that we are admitting these uh, students from <laughs> uh, who, tend, who are going ultimately to these other schools, and there may be, it may be worth our while to try and uh, retain more of them and increase uh, the utilization of our capacity. So I'm not sure what our capacity really is, but, you know, let's say it's 90%. That gives us a lot of room uh, in order to um, maybe make up some numbers. And one of the other limiting factors is the number of beds we have because we want to um, uh, be able to uh, offer uh, guaranteed housing for 90% of the students here and then 25% of sophomores and 10% of juniors or whatever. And I think we have to look at that as, a, as, as an issue because uh, I think um, Interim Provost uh, McMaster at one time told told us that the number of beds was one of the limiting factors that we had. Now we've, we've added beds, you know, we're buying University Village now, Pioneer Hall is going to reopen, which is going to increase uh, the number of beds, and I'm not sure how that affects that 6,100 number, but I think we need to look closer at that. And then also, um, it wouldn't be an enrollment discussion if I didn't bring up test optional. Well done. <laughs> So I'm going to bring it up just briefly, just going to mention it, test optional. Uh, it increases diversity, increases average ACT score. It does a lot of great things. It um, also uh, gets students' attention um, because I think if we're the first uh, one of our peers to do that, we're going to get a little bit uh, more notoriety for being first and get people's attention, and I think that's something that uh, we should always try to do. Lastly, I want to just ask a question about the uh, students of color number that uh, the slide that was up a little while ago with 23.1%. Uh, and I just wanted to ask, is that the, that does not include international students. Correct. Am I correct? Because if, if you add in international students, you know, most of whom are, you know, students of color, um, <clears throat> it would be in the neighborhood of, I think, 30% for Twin Cities. Is that? Um, yes. Chair Omari and, and Regent Shu, that, that's correct. Uh, the, the number does not include international students, but this is the way it's reported nationally in iPads. So we use a standard set of categories. 
Yep. And we're starting to get disaggregated data to see where what identifiers these students of color actually uh, have, because I imagine that it'll be skewed to specific populations. So thank you for that. Uh, Regent Shu, one other thing that I think we have to keep in mind is what is the monetary value of keeping an ACT of 28 from a rankings perspective, whether or not we have some sort of, you know, very hard to measure dollar kickback from having a higher ranking, which is directly linked to the ACT, and I'm ready to have the optional conversation too with you. Um, so I don't know if we even know that, if we can measure, you know, as our rankings go up, which is tied to the ACT, I imagine somehow that turns into money at some point. Where and how, I don't know. Uh, very quickly, yeah. Chair Omari, let me just answer that question for you. So if, um, if you have a higher ACT score, you get the attention of non-residents who are willing, will be willing to pay more to come here. And we get higher rankings in other areas, so that, right. So yes, I, I agree with you. Uh, Regent Swiggum. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, Regent Sue has not convinced me of test optional yet at all. And in fact, I just go the opposite direction and say that uh, if a high school student, Minnesota high school student had a uh, ACT of 30, they would be guaranteed admission here, or if they were in the top 10% of their class. And you, of course, told me that a lot of schools aren't reporting class ranks anymore, so that would be a problem. But I would rather go that direction. My question, just to follow up on my questions of this morning, Mr. McMaster, and uh, I won't dwell on it. Let me first tell you that uh, from my personal feeling, my personal philosophy, I don't think graduating with some debt from college is the worst thing in the world. I'm going to bet that every person sitting around this table graduated from their alma mater with some debt. No. Um, now it doesn't have to be $300,000. It might be thirty, dollars whatever. But I don't think it's the worst thing in the world to have that connection and to have that, that, that importance of what it is in life to you. You have to, uh, it'd be more important to you, I feel. I will also tell you that I will also feel very, very strong that the best form of student aid is low tuition. The lowest tuition is the best form of student aid. I believe that sincerely. And I might be all wet, but that's, that's what I believe. Um, and I do realize that uh, our tuition could be in the neighborhood of 7 to 7.5% 7 less across the board for all students if we didn't reallocate to some of our scholarship programs. I uh, recognize that. I, I just have this, this feeling that uh, we should not be using tuition of any students to reduce debt of others, to reduce cost of admission. And I, I have the feeling that the state dollars appropriated are for all students, not just some, or if, you know, those who might get a promised scholarship or a legacy scholarship. It's for all students. And that's, that's just where I come from. That's just the, the feeling I have. I wonder if, when my alma mater calls, they call about three times a year. And they're very, very smart because they call with students. The students call. And they say, uh, the student, the young girl says on the other end of the phone, I wouldn't be here if you weren't, a, if you weren't contributing, if you didn't give development. If we just, is it possible that we could just do development dollars uh, for our university scholarships? Could we, could we just call mm -hmm. Steve Swigum and say, the only reason I can come is that your additional $500 allows me to do that and, and not redistribute from other tuition of students or other state dollars that come in. Is, is that at all possible? Uh, sh should, I, should I turn to the, the president over uh, and, and uh, No, I, I, the president and I have talked about this. Oh. <laughs> So you're trying to get other data points. Yeah. Acting Provost McMaster. Chair Omari and Regent Swig and I was really hoping the president was going to jump into that. I tried. There. Apparently not. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, first of all, we do, we do have a large number of scholarships that come from philanthropy. I, I thought, okay, a huge number, and you're going to see it soon in another presentation here. In terms of the promise, which is what you're talking about, the promise program, which is 29 million, it's it would down to 29. Well, for the whole I thought system, it was 34, and then I heard it was down to 31. Now it's down to 29. We'll call it 30. We'll, we'll round today to. Uh, you would need an enormous endowment to generate 30 million a year if 
one could do that, I think that would be terrific. Uh, and say maybe one day we'll get there. Without that and without promise, related to the conversation on diversity and first generation and low income, we would significantly reduce all the numbers in those charts that I just showed you. And I don't think that would be an overarching goal of the institution, is to bring in fewer students of color and fewer first generation and fewer low income students. So that, I, I realize that's not in agreement with you, but that, that's what I think is very important here is it, it adds to access and diversity. I, I respect that, Mr. Chairman, I respect that. I just, just want you, in my own personal, I was a first generation student and I did graduate with some debt. Sure. Significant, and it wasn't the worst thing in the world for me. Thank you. All right, we are well behind time, uh, members. So we're gonna move to the next item. If folks wanna get up and stretch, feel free to do so as we transition into graduate and professional education part four, impact and outcomes of professional education. And we have four presenters that will join us at the table. Um, and so please come on up while they are setting the, the PowerPoint. I just, I just have a few notes on this next presentation. Um, as Regent Domari uh, mentioned, this is the fourth presentation in your series about graduate and professional education. Uh, please recall that in September we articulated the fundamental distinction between graduate and professional education that exists at the university, uh, as well as across the country. And in October, you discuss key aspects and challenges. Members, please. Uh, We've got an opening going right now from the acting provost, so please, if I can have your attention, that would be great. Regents, thank you. Um, and in October, you discussed key aspects and challenges facing graduate and professional education, including academic planning, enrollment management, and financing. At your last meeting, Vice Provost Scott Lanyon shared with you outcomes and impacts from graduate education. So today's agenda item is, is the second half of that discussion, this time focusing on the outcomes and impacts associated with professional education. Just one comment on professional education. Remember that the distinction between graduate and professional education involves research and, and primary uh, activities. So a major portion of graduate education degree programs, PhD programs, MA programs, involve research or creative activity. Professional education, which is the focus of today's conversation, includes programs whose graduates most often seek applied professional or practice-based employment, where there is often a requirement of licensure to practice or where outside accreditation bodies play an important role. Some of the key professional programs, of course, uh, at the university or the MD, the PharmD, the DDS, the JD, the MPH, the MBA, and about 40 other programs. So that will be the focus of today's uh, conversation. We have uh, two initial presenters from the university's professional education council. Uh, Carissa Slutterback is an associate professor and associate dean in the Humphrey School, and John Kepke is professor of landscape architecture in the College of Design, and I think they're going to introduce our guests who are joining them today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Omari and members of the board. I want to kick off the presentation by framing up a conversation around the impacts of professional education in Minnesota that the University of Minnesota and our many graduates who stay here have on the state and on the communities. I wanna start by sharing a little bit of the work of Miles Shaver, who's one of our faculty at the Carlson School of Management. Um, as the Professional Education Council, which I have the pleasure to serve on along with John, um, was discussing and preparing for this presentation and thinking about how to articulate what's happening in professional education and the impacts on the state, we thought his work was particularly relevant because he asks why Minnesota has the economy that it has with the impressive concentration and diversity of businesses. He has a book that's entitled Headquarters Economy, which you have in front of you. And he goes on to explain that it's not just the headquarters that are part of the region's thriving economy, but also the privately held companies and many other employers that are distributed across the Twin Cities <clears throat> region and across the state. 
His research definitely has a Twin Cities focus, but the scope of the presentation we want to give you today is not limited to the Twin Cities. As someone who grew up in greater Minnesota, I know it's important to really actually acknowledge that we have headquarters companies that are in Duluth, they're in Rochester, and many other major employers that are distributed across the state and provide opportunities for many of our graduates. Um, the robust economy and our employment prospects, I think, are reflective of the impact of professional education that the university has on the state of Minnesota. If you haven't read Miles Shaver's book, um, you might want to check it out. Um, there's also a URL that's on the slide that's in front of you. And this is a link to a brief YouTube video where you can watch a short presentation. It's definitely interesting, thought-provoking, and I think provides some useful context as we think about professional education. And I think as you watch this video or check out the book, you will hear about two key findings from his scholarship that I think really explain in important ways, Minnesota's healthy collection of businesses and employers. So first, he says that we are able to build human capital and continue to develop a talented workforce in the state, particularly among professional managers. And second, we're able to do this because the human capital actually stays in the state. So he jokes in the video, and maybe you've heard this joke as well, that it's sometimes hard to attract people to move to Minnesota, but it's impossible to get them to leave once they're here, something we are all very proud of as Minnesotans. Um, he says that this is because the quality of life here and the relative cost of achieving a similar or higher quality of life in other locations. So Shaver concludes that professional management actually stays here, but they also are moving across companies and industries in order to advance, which serves to further enhance the economy. So we believe that professional education at the University of Minnesota has something to do with Shaver's first two points. So first, we think that professionals choose to stay in the region and in the state because they have the opportunity to turn to the University of Minnesota's professional education programs for their professional development. And second, those graduates are actually in turn contributing to the quality of life that's keeping them here and keeping other professionals in the state. So for example, Shaver talks specifically about how Minnesota's public education system is different than many other public education systems across the country. And it has an effect on people's decisions to stay here and our ability to retain that highly trained human capital who might consider the need to, and the cost of sending their kids to private school if they were moved to different locations. So this robust public education system, the high level of human capital that we have, I think is really important and really have a relationship. Um, as as um, Dr. McMaster referenced, um, you've heard in the past presentations that talk about the impacts of public education um, in Minnesota. You've heard about the university's Master of Education programs and the ways that they work together to really create an attractive environment for professionals. I like to think that our Humphrey School programs in urban planning, public policy, and others really contribute to the robust public sector, agencies, services, and institutions, as well as the robust nonprofit sector that further contribute to the quality of life. So overall, we think that professional education has a really important story to tell and has important impacts on the state. Um, last spring, I believe you heard a presentation from Provost Hansen, um, who had shared information about the work of the Professional Education Council. We as a council have been working to create a work plan of key professional education issues and topics. And at the top of that list, the council discussed how to better articulate to key audiences like you and others the impacts of professional education that it has on our state and on our communities. So we think the presentation is timely. We want to begin to think about how, the, how to tell the story and the impacts of professional education. The story is robust, but it's also complicated. We have a wide range of programs, a lot of range, a lot of breadth, and it's a complicated but I think important story to tell. So as a first step, we as a professional education council working with administrators at the university um, are gathering information from each program, data like um, individual stories about outputs and impacts that programs are having, what are the organizations or sectors that our graduates are employed in, what are the earnings look like, as well as some of the unique contributions of unique programs that we have in Minnesota that don't exist in other places. And we've shared a lot of this material in the docket that you have. So if you've had a chance to look at some of the docket materials, you've seen some interesting stories about um, program impacts. 
you might also be able to tell that our work in gathering and interpreting these data are actually just beginning. So we're excited to continue to shape and refine the story of the impacts of professional education at the university and also in the state. For now, there are some themes that are emerging, and you have the six themes that are in front of you. They're listed on the slide, and we want to connect with some examples from your docket and some other data that we've gathered. So as we discuss these themes, I want you to think back as well, or encourage you to think back as well, to Shaver's two economic drivers, the development of human capital, how we're contributing to that, and how it's reinforced and connected to quality of life. So I'll talk about the first couple of themes and then turn it over to John. The first theme being we educate a large proportion of the professional workforce in the region. The data that you have in the docket shows that we educate um, or that we have more than 50 degree programs enrolling 30 or more students in 2018. This fall, another way of thinking about this is we had almost um, 10,000 students in over 250 degree programs and certificates. And I think I'll highlight the certificate piece. Often these are flexible, part-time opportunities for professionals to get targeted training, often in new areas that complements and allows them to move up within their organizations or transition to other organizations. That's sort of reinforcing the movement and economy. In many cases, the university is the only provider of um, particular professional training in the state and the region. Um, we have several unique degrees at the Humphrey School, the only accredited program in urban planning. Um, we have a Master of Human Rights degree that doesn't exist anywhere else in the state, a Master of Development Practice as well, and several of those programs are in collaboration with other colleges. So we're providing these unique interdisciplinary opportunities that don't exist elsewhere in the state. So they're attracting students to us, and in many cases they're staying here. Your docket also lists the largest degree programs at the university. This slide that you have in front of you includes the top 15 professional education programs that were conferred last academic year. The MBA or business administration is at the top of that list. As you know, we have full-time and part-time programs providing flexibility for students um, who are at different points in their career, allowing them to get that professional development. Um, teaching is another big contributor. You've certainly heard about medicine and dentistry and the unique <laughs> opportunities and contributions that those programs make to training those professionals who often stay in the state. You see things like social work, veterinary medicine, healthcare administration, human resources and industrial um, relations, and many others. So last year we had over 2,000 degrees um, conferred in this area. Um, the next slide that you have in front of you shows that in addition to the large number of professional degrees, there's additional evidence that suggests that a high proportion of those graduates actually get jobs and stay in Minnesota, contributing to the robust economy, but also contributing in terms of um, revenues that are generated. <coughs> so your docket has several examples, but the slide you have in front of you shows the percent of university graduates with post-baccalaureate degrees. So this is going to be PhD degrees as well as um, professional degrees. So I think it underrepresents a bit um, the number of graduates who are likely to stay in Minnesota. This is from 2013 to 2014. So we see three quarters of public administration and social service professions, business management and marketing, education, communication journalism and related programs having really large proportions of graduates who are staying in the state and contributing to our economy. And then the last theme that I want to hit on before I turn over to John is the impact theme two. So our professional programs emphasize excellence, rigor, and innovation. And there are lots of ways to be able to measure this, to talk about it. One of the ways that you see often highlighted is rankings. It's something that's easy to tag onto. I know you've already talked about this a little bit today. But um, many of the rankings of the different professional education programs are highlighted in your docket. We have education programs that are in the top 10 or top 20. We have certainly um, great rankings for our law school, medical school, the Carlson School of Business, um, Doctor of Nursing Practices in the top 10. Um, U.S. News and World Report is an often cited source of rankings. In that report, um, pharmacy is number two, the Humphrey School is number nine, clinical psychology is number four, vet med is number nine also, School of Public Health is eight, educational psychology is number nine, and there are lots of others. So those are just a few highlights. There's lots of data that's in your docket. John is going to tell us a little bit more about some of the other themes emerging from these data. Thank you. Professor Kepke? Thank you, uh, Chairman O'Reilly. Steve, members of the board, and Crystal, thank you. Excellent, excellent job. Uh, well, in the interest of time, because we know you've been here all day long, uh, we'll take these two uh, themes together. Uh, 
because there is some connection. Uh, the data in your docket suggests uh, that the, this third theme, that professional programs are responsive to workforce demands and occupational needs, and the fourth theme, that programs help retain, attract, and attract talent and students to the state and the region. Um, the next slide, uh, we'll be looking at uh, in your docket, also uh, there's a, a number of information, a number of, uh, lost my train <laughs> number of uh, uh, information about the uh, job growth and also about um, uh, program placement. And if you'll uh, pay attention to this, uh, this theme in mind, we consider that uh, the slide that Scott Lanyon shared with you uh, in December, and it, uh, it bears repeating that the job growth in the post-baccalaureate levels is really uh, quite high. If you'll notice, it's above 16% with the master's degree level. And in the professional degrees, it's just below 14%. The next slide, um, and we want to talk a little bit about the College of Education and Human Development, and that prepares uh, the largest number of K through 12 teachers in, in Minnesota. And the Master's of Addiction Counseling degree uh, is addressing that counselor shortage in Minnesota, particularly given our opioid crisis and other things that we're dealing with. And the medical school is working to address a national shortage of primary physicians, and they are keeping them in Minnesota, as we'll see by uh, placement rate. So this slide illustrates uh, the regional occupations and demand requiring professional master's degrees. Uh, just to point out a few, child, family, and social service, social workers, uh, there's a 9% uh, projected growth rate, and there are uh, 9,697 openings. So if you look through this and in your docket, you'll be able to see there's a number of, of uh, occupations, and there's a huge demand, and our university and our professional programs are filling that niche. Um, and we're looking at professional uh, occupations in the manner requiring professional doctoral degrees. We can also see that uh, many of these are in the medical fields, but you can see uh, their medium uh, annual wage income, how that contributes to the state's economy, the projected growth in those particular areas, mm -hmm. and the uh, projected openings that are uh, going to be available in the future. So many of our uh, programs um, report uh, job placement rates of over 85%. Um, I'll skip through this one, I just talked about that. All programs report job placement rates of over 85%. So you can see uh, 98 to 100% of occupational therapists from our programs are working in the field within six months of graduation. Uh, law, uh, job placement rates for doctor of nurses practice, uh, and one that I might highlight is 85. 87.5% of Masters of Architecture graduates, which in my college, College of Design, were employed within six months, and the Masters of Landscape Architecture reports, that's my field, 90% uh, placement. And you can see there are a number of others there as well. And in Carissa's uh, college, uh, Humphrey, um, 99 to 100% job placement rate for the Humphrey School 2017 Masters of Urban and Regional Planning and the Masters of Public Policy graduates. And this contributes their work and all the work and all these people contribute to that quality of life that we look for in Minnesota and that help retain our students and uh, build a better uh, place for all of us to live. So most of the programs also reported a 70% or higher job placement in Minnesota or the region. Uh, you can see uh, there's just a few examples on here. The Master of Professional Studies, Addiction Counseling, 100% job placement. Uh, Masters of Social Work, Duluth, 93% respondents, postgraduate surveyed reported working in Minnesota. Um, 86.8% of UM teacher licensure students of 2017 graduated class reported working in Minnesota. 74% of the Masters of Landscape Architecture, my program graduates, from the past seven years work here in Minnesota. That can be a problem for us because we're trying to establish our national reputation and all the students want to stay here. In fact, many times we get students who even come from California to here because of our program and the qualities that we have, and then we can't get them to leave and go back home to spread the word about how great the University of Minnesota Landscape Architecture Program is. Uh, impact five, uh, theme five, we prevent illness, improve health, and save lives. Uh, the University of Minnesota Medical School has a network of more than 12,000 accomplished MD, MD, PhD living alumni in the state, uh, with, with nearly 7,000 living in Minnesota who are, who are not retired. So we're really filling that niche for uh, primary care and other specialties here in Minnesota. 
And the Carlson MBA students uh, recently took first place in a national case competition for proposed interventions in an opio opioid crisis. And you wouldn't think of the Carlson, Carlson MBA students as working on opioid, but I think it's a really interesting uh, project. And you can see here there's a URL that you can uh, go to and read about some of the successes and their first place uh, uh, finish. Uh, impact theme six, uh, we tackle challenges of relevance to the local and global community. Um, and this, again, goes along with our uh, focus and the board's focus on the grand challenges that we face here at the university and in our, our state and country. Programs report alumni who serve on the government and nonprofit boards and lend expertise to public's benefit. Kristen Robb, who's actually a graduate of our Masters of Landscape Architecture program that I work with, and also the Masters of uh, Public Health and a BA um, here, uh, is director of the Minnesota's Department of Health and Climate uh, Health Program, which shapes the state's public health policies on climate change. And there's a URL you can go URL you can go here to to see her some of her work. And she's also hired another one of our landscape architecture graduates to assist her in that. Because of the way we think about the general environment and how important health is in the agricultural sector, in the water, water quality, all those kinds of things that that uh, climate change will potentially have an impact on. Uh, CEHD's Multiple Pathways to Teaching Initiative creates new pathways for students to earn te teacher licensure, and we know there's been a shortage of that, and so it really widens the pipeline for non-traditional students uh, while addressing teacher shortage in the state, particularly in outstate Minnesota. And there's a collaborative project we want to call to your attention to be the Masters of GIS students, uh, Geographic Information Systems, and faculty. University of Minnesota Libraries and Augsburg College, and they're, they've been using GIS uh, mapping technologies to examine racial, uh, racially restrictive covenants in housing deeds in the city of Minneapolis, and beginning to try and address those issues and bringing those to the attention of our policymakers. So professional education uh, impact themes, I'm gonna turn it back over to Carissa, and she's gonna uh, conclude and then introduce our speaker, our other speakers. Great. I hope we were able to hit on a few highlights um, of the data that were in your docket. I think where they're starting to relate to a number of themes which we were able to share a bit on today. I think in addition to hearing from John and I as members of the Professional Education Council, we know that we can only tell part of the story and we're lucky to be joined today by some community leaders who are as well um, program alumni um, from professional education at the University of Minnesota and I think they really round out the story and give us a deeper sense of the impacts of professional education in the state. So I'm very grateful to Holly Ainsley, who is the Vice President for Capital Market Solutions at Ameriprise Financial. She's a graduate of the University's Master of Financial Math program in the College of Science and Engineering. And then also Cheryl Ramstead is the Chief External Relations Officer at Hennepin Healthcare, and she has a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree from the University of Minnesota. And with apologies, I believe that Cheryl has to scoot a little bit before four, so we're going to let her go first. Thank you, Carissa. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the uh, board. I'm honored to be here to discuss with you the ways in which my life has been enhanced and my contributions to the community enriched by my post-baccalaureate professional education at the University of Minnesota. In 2017, I was one of the 109 who earned a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree after having been one of 63 in 2013 who was awarded the Master of Nursing degree. By way of briefly describing my background, I was sworn into the Minnesota Bar in 1975 and spent many years in public service prior to entering the nursing field. In 1979, while serving as a federal prosecutor, I was involved in a serious airplane crash and sustained burns over 37% of my body. After two months in the burn unit and seven major surgeries, I returned to my legal career, eventually spending 14 years as a judge, four years in the governor's cabinet as commissioner of corrections, and 14 years as a trial lawyer at Ryder Bennett Law Firm. While serving as a judge, I learned about the university's Master of Nursing program and began taking prerequisites needed for admission. I did so quietly, on my own time, and without telling anyone what I was doing. It took four years of one course at a time, each semester, year round, to fulfill the prerequisites I needed to apply. I was motivated by a desire to give back to the burn community by encouraging others involved in catastrophic accidents 
to realize that there could indeed be life after burns. As a result of pursuing my master's and doctorate in nursing practice, I had the opportunity to return to Regions Burn Center, where I had been hospitalized after my crash, to work with burn patients and their families and conduct burn support groups. I served on the Regents Hospital Foundation Board, I chaired an event that raised over a million dollars for the Burn Center, and I joined the International Board of Directors for the Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors. I'm very grateful to the Health Innovation and Leadership DNP program for the practicums I had, helping to create a new nurse residency program at Methodist Hospital to design an employee wellness program for the Ronald McDonald House, to work with Somali patients and their interpreters at the People's Center Medical Clinic, and to assist a healthcare architect in conducting a major study at a Canadian hospital. Through these experiences, I gained a better understanding of how diverse the healthcare profession can be and the myriad of options that were available to me with these degrees. My first postgraduate full-time position in healthcare has been at Hennepin Healthcare, where for the past 16 months, I've been the Chief External Relations Officer. In this position, I oversee external and internal relations and communications, strategic partnerships, and public policy and advocacy. I've mentored students from the School of Nursing and currently serve as the president of the School of Nursing Alumni Society. Through my experiences at the university, I've made lifelong friends and am constantly looking for ways I can promote the university's educational program to others, even joining the AARP Executive Council to use that as a platform for encouraging others similarly situated to come back to school at the university. In addition, I've recruited people I met through the university to become involved in the work I'm doing at Hennepin Healthcare. Dean Connie Delaney from the School of Nursing recently became chair of Hennepin Healthcare's Public Research Advisory Board, and Marie Manthe of School of Nursing, living legend, joined our community advisory board. In closing, I want to thank you as members of the Board of Regents for supporting the back post-baccalaureate professional education programs in the School of Nursing, which have had such a tremendous impact on my life. They not only opened up a whole new world of service to me, but also helped me make, pass, make peace with my past by using my experiences as a burn survivor to support others who have had life-altering accidents like my own. The university's mission to advance learning to benefit the people of Minnesota and to apply scholarly expertise to community program problems, as well as to inspire and empower individuals such as myself, is truly met by programs such as those in which I've been privileged to participate. Thank you for the opportunities provided to me. Thank you, Ms. Ramstad. Ms. Ainsley? Oh my. So, um, good afternoon, Chair Omari, uh, members of the board. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you about some of my experiences at, with the Master's in Financial Math program and how it's been relevant to me in my career more specifically, but also in my industry more broadly. So first, just to give you a little bit of background on me, I graduated from the University of Minnesota with a BA in economics with a quantitative emphasis. And I was lucky enough to get a job right out of undergrad working at the former GMAC ResCap, which was General Motors Mortgage Company, uh, in their risk analytics group. Specifically, my team implemented econometric models of mortgage borrower behavior. And that was really my first opportunity to see what a career in financial risk management might look like. And I was really lucky to be able to work with such smart people. And it was really an invigorating and exciting time, although my timing was a little bit um, unfortunate or maybe not so just in how much it shaped me. But uh, just two years after I started there was 
basically the subprime mortgage crisis. So you can imagine um, many of the people on my team ended up sort of spreading out and moving to different areas. And a cohort of people that I worked with moved to Ameriprise, which I followed. And their mandate was to essentially redesign the variable annuity hedging program at Ameriprise. So uh, I followed there and joined, and I, again, had the opportunity to work with really, really smart people. Most of the people on my team had PhDs or were actuaries, and my role was largely a, kind of a junior analyst, putting reports together and that sort of thing. And it became pretty clear to me at that point, if I wanted to progress in my career, I was going to need to go back to school. And so there were a couple of key things that, that sort of drew me to the Master's in Financial Math program. The first was the fact that it was geared toward professional, um, pro, you know, professional working professionals, which meant that I could keep my job and I could go to school in the evening. So obviously that was extremely appealing to me. There were other programs I had looked at that I thought were interesting, but they were only offered during the day. So I and I wasn't able to quit my job. So that was the first thing that was appealing. But the second was that MFM was really ingrained in the culture at Ameriprise. At the time, I worked with some of the instructors and professors, and also a number of people I worked with were also MFM grads. So it was really normal and natural for people to consider attending this program if you worked in my team. So um, I think the most valuable experience that I've had having gone through this program was the fact that I was able to connect with this working quantitative professional community and we really had a place to find each other. I think that the most beneficial part is, is that you it's a small community and now we know each other. So even if you work in different companies, there's a common thread and it's a place for us to sort of say, hey, are you hiring um, or I'm hiring, I need somebody with certain skills and it's just it, it's been really valuable to me to be able to, to find those people. So um, just to give you a little insight now, since I've graduated uh, in my role, I, I don't look like your typical MFM grad. Um, I am not a quant, actually. My role consists of primarily translating technical, complex, quantitative concepts to really smart and dedicated people that may not necessarily have a quantitative background. So um, a lot of senior leaders, board members, um, risk committees and internal and external auditors. So that's the function that I largely, ro I, I, the function I have, and um, this program really helped me be able to, to sort of speak the language of more of these sort of financial engineers, but yet, you know, be able to talk to normal people. Um, no offense to my delightful <laughs> coworkers. So um, I guess one other thing I'd want to point out is that my team consists of, it's about 50-50 New York and Minneapolis, and within the Minneapolis team, we are 50% MFM grads. So this is definitely something that we, we look for. And you know, when I'm looking to hire people, uh, what I typically look for, my, the most important thing, and I'll, I'll borrow a phrase from my, uh, my leader, Phil Jones, who is also a former professor in the program, is that we, the most important thing is to find somebody with a well-organized brain. And the MFM program graduates people with well-organized brains. So it's really a great source for us to find people um, in that regard. So I hope that this has been helpful to give you a little bit of insight in how this program has really become relevant to me in my career and, and how it is in my community. And I thank you again for your time. Thank you. So you're saying I would not get hired then in your team? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> Are you saying your brain's not organized? No. <laughs> there are many Scattered. ways to get at that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to acknowledge, thank you again, Ms. Ramstad, for coming. Uh, we understand that you have to run, but thank you for being here. And uh, be safe and on the roads. Members, questions, comments? Uh, Regent Simonson. Thank you. And thank you for sharing your stories. And I like that about giving back. That was really, really good. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's no question in my mind that we have a great professional program uh, globally, uh, having graduated here myself with a PhD. So that's not even a, a question in my mind. Um, just a couple of points. It would be interesting when I look at this one page, I don't know what it is, uh, where it shows the medium annual wage and projected growth. Um, <clears throat> I think it would really be nice to see what that really contributes to Minnesota. 
in terms of tax dollars and other other income to Minnesota, if that could be could be broken out. And then I see we've got the uh, the medium annual wage here, so half above, half below, I guess is what we're talking about. And I'm involved with veterinarians, and so I deal with most of them that are half below. And uh, I read an article not that long ago, but the millennial veterinarians getting out with about $138,000 in, in debt. Uh, and their starting salary, a lot of them are below that. Increase in suicide, increase in anxiety, increase in depression. They had a lot, and that's global. I mean, it's all across the United States, not just Minnesota, but it's Minnesota as well. So I'm wondering how that's being looked at in our professional program, if it is at all. I think... I think that we have some a starting point with some of the data that's available here. And as you can see, some of this comes from the Department of Employment and Economic Development. I think as we continue to have conversations within the Professional Education Council about more deeply understanding these impacts, I think we have an opportunity to dig into some of the things that you're talking about. So how, you know, how is this median annual wage distributed across the state? Are there significant variations if we're looking at the metro area versus greater Minnesota? How does that relate to the distribution of our graduates? I, don't, I think those are next opportunities that we have to understand even more deeply some of the impacts and some of the kind of broader social implications that that has as on our graduates and people working in these fields. So I think more to come um, on that piece. It's a great yes. question. Professor Kepke, did you want to comment? Uh, yes, Chairman O'Mari. I was just going to say that the, our council, Professional Education Council, is relatively new. And so one of, the, one of the opportunities we took this fall was to actually create the materials in your docket to get a better handle on on uh, professional education in the broad sense at the University of Minnesota. And, and probably like all good Minnesotans, right, we've been hiding our, our light under a bushel basket. So we, we really are just getting an, an understanding of all the programs, what they're contributing. So I think uh, taking a deeper dive in, as Carissa said, uh, into these numbers would be a really useful next step for us and then be able to come back to the board and present that information. So thank you very much, Sal. Thank you. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. This has been a terrific presentation. We talk a lot about degrees and schools and colleges, but less about occupations and the connection to uh, to uh, to business. I did notice, and we didn't you didn't get a chance to talk about the certificate programs, but mm -hmm. we do a lot of that. Is that a growing business asking us to be the certification house for um, all these occupations? Yeah, um, Regent Omari and board members, on that piece, I think what we're seeing is um, graduate level or professional um, certificates that are an, an educational credential rather than a formal certification that would maybe be conducted by an external certifying organization. So when we say certificates, it's more about academic certificates, a completion of a series of courses or academic credits that gets you an additional credential on top of a bachelor's degree or on top of an existing master's degree. Often it's a specialized area of expertise. Um, at the Humphrey School, we have uh, certificates in early childhood education and policy. That's one area. If you were working maybe in the public policy area and you wanted to focus in particular on early childhood issues, this certification could get you that additional credential that allows you to move up in your job, something like that. So often we're seeing it with specialized emerging opportunity areas where we have new areas of focus within an occupation or a sort of professional area where we see certificates being developed as a way to be responsive of workforce needs, but also in some cases a market opportunity. Thank you. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Amari. Thank you, presenters. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, the, the page that you have up here now, I'm not sure what the, did you say how um, it says the projected growth rate and then projected openings, over how much time is that? Is that just one year or 10 years or? Regent Omari and board members, I'm not sure I might defer to Dr. McMaster on that one, yeah, um, the origin of the data. <laughs> it, come, it comes from our institutional data sets, and I'm, I'm also not sure the, the temporal range, but we can get that for you. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I mean, I just want to draw your attention to the line with lawyers on it. 9.2% <laughs> um, <laughs> projected growth rate, 6,646 
Minnesota projected openings. I think we graduate 200 lawyers a year here, mm -hmm. so I think there's opportunity in our law school for a little bit more throughput. You want to go back to school? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, admit, just maybe admit some more. <laughs> Regent Anderson. Thank you. Uh, my question is very brief. Thank you, Regent Amari. Um, access and, and not necessarily the affordability part, but the access part. Um, none of you are here from Carlson, I don't think. But um, are we doing things on weekends and evenings to be flexible and responsive to people with uh, current jobs and current employment? Because that's that's a complaint I have heard in my four mm -hmm. years here, especially with the MBA program. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we have one example from Ms. Ainsley. That, exactly, that went, she, yeah. but she was CSC. Yeah, CSC. So I, am at, I know there's a part-time MBA program, which uh, certainly serves those who are working full-time. They have intense weekend courses. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if there are other programs as well, but I know there's a part. I think it's, I think it's real important, and I, and I have heard that we have had people that can't get in and they go somewhere else because it's not as flexible as they would prefer. So that's just my comment. Thanks. Uh, Regent Powell. Well, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation. Really appreciate the personal stories. I think that brings it brings it to life. And, and you know, it's really very positive story. Um, you know, great programs, strong demand for our graduates. Seems like things are generally very, very positive. I'm wondering, you know, what you what do you worry about? What, where are the risks? I mean, we saw a very disruptive change in the market for lawyers going back six or seven years, and that's been, you know, that's been very tough and very challenging. And maybe that's one sort of watch out. But I'm just sort of would like to get a feel from you for what we should be most concerned about um, looking forward. Thank you, Regent Powell. And, and while the two of you present, I actually wanted to ask Ms. Ainsley if you think we should be doing things differently or what we should be doing the same from your perspective as you're out uh, uh, working as well. So we'll give you a little time and put them on the spot right now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start? Oh, well, uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Regent Powell and Chairman Omari. Um, I think that a lot of the management and development of degree programs, professional de degree programs, happens within the colleges. And they're trying to keep a handle on what the trends and workforce needs are. Um, and so it would, be, it would be difficult for us, I think, to necessarily answer that question we would need to have sort of a broader survey, and that's something we can do in our professional uh, 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 work group at, and look at what people are seeing as in trends in terms of professional education and possibly bring that back to the board because we really haven't addressed that in anything that we've done up to this point. That's all I can say. Hey, um, Regent Omari and our sorry, Chair Omari and Regent Powell and board members, I think the Professional Education Council gives us a great venue in which to have these kinds of conversations. I think we have an opportunity to be even more responsive to changing workforce needs and look at how they align with the kinds of professional education programs, the content of them, new opportunities to, to be responsive in that space as it relates to industry and other employers in the state. I think also the point that um, was, was just raised as well around access to professional education. Um, I think that relates to the, the timing, um, schedule constraints, um, location of professional education programs, as well as cost as we think about access for underrepresented groups. Thank you. Um, thank you for your question, Chair Amari, uh, members of the board. So I, I think if when I think about the program I was in and what was uh, probably the most useful and the best aspect of it was engaging the local community. So one of the one of the classes that you take in the MFM program is sort of a practitioner's course and they have people come in and do modules who are um, high members, leaders in the community, different, different insurance companies and um, hedge funds, for example, and just having the access to see what people are really doing with this information with their learning and having a way to apply it, I think it w is really key it just because if you're going to go through the trouble of, you know, taking your evenings away from your family to go back to school, you want to kind of see exactly how that's going to benefit you. And I think that was probably the best part about it. And I think if there's more community engagement, um, that will make it much more useful and, and a, a good use of their time and resources. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, Chairman Omari, I was going to say um, there's been an emphasis, I think, by 
uh, across the university on this notion of lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. And so I know in our colleges, we've had a lot of discussion about how do we reach out to those professionals that are practicing and bringing them back in to try and give them opportunities. So we are trying to develop certificate programs and also uh, some masters of science programs that are that are um, that are shorter in length and more flexible in their scheduling. So we're trying to do that as well. Um, and then I, I would say in terms of the, the professional uh, programs and the people that they graduate, because so many of them locate here in the Twin Cities area and in Minnesota in general, we're able to bring those people back in and work with our students, our master students, and in uh, adjunct teaching, but also in being presenters and uh, working with students on particular projects. So it's great to have the kind of professional graduates we have right here in the Twin Cities area or even in, in Duluth if we're working at UMD. I know they do the same thing. And having those real world, world experiences brought back to our students. So that's, that's another side benefit of a really strong professional education programs here at the university. Excellent. Thank the you. one thing I wanted to add too is, uh, I was sitting in here listening to some of the other discussions and I am a, uh, first generation college student who happens to be Ojibwe in heritage, uh, came into the University of Minnesota and I uh, went to a five year professional program at the time that we have landscape architecture and got a master's degree from the University of Washington but that came back to teach here at the, at the University of Minnesota. And I have to say uh, I and my family are eternally grateful to the University of Minnesota for, for what it's provided for my life and, um, and for my children's lives and, and for just really changing the trajectory of my, my family. Thank you for that. Uh, Regent Johnson, last comment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to um, um, personalize this a bit. Thank you for your uh, comments, Ms. Ainsley. Thank you for yours. Uh, Ms. Ramstead, uh, I've known the Ramstead family for some time. Uh, Ms. Ramstead's uh, brother, Jim Ramstead was my seatmate in the state senate, went on to become a congressman, and uh, all of us have participated in graduations. But one of the graduations I remember was the day Miss Ramstead came across the stage and I gave her her diploma for her doctorate of nursing. And it was very emotional for her as well as her family uh, that particular day, having known something about what she had experienced in life following that plane crash. And so uh, that's part of the reward, if you will, of, of the job that we have and being a part of the university community. So we thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you to the presenters. We appreciate you being here. Please be safe uh, when you take off and enjoy uh, tomorrow and the weekend. Next up, we will ask uh, our acting provost to come back to the front table. And members, I want to just start this conversation by saying this is something that the vice chair of this committee, uh, Regent Lucas, myself, Ms. Flotten, uh, in the administration really wanted to put on this year's agenda so that we can try as members of this board to get a better grasp of a holistic view of this financial uh, burden that students face and trying to gather as much information as we can and not just relying on what's automatically reported to us. Uh, and we, we know that we'll still probably come up short because people don't have to tell us what they don't want to tell us. Uh, but we want to get the best uh, idea of what the holistic financial burden is. In line with that, as we were having our uh, docket preview meeting, Regent Lucas and I discussed it, d discovered that uh, Acting Provost McMaster has a lot of information to present, and even more than what's in your dockets. And so at that meeting last week, we decided that we will have a part two in May. So we want to use this meeting to get through as much information as we can have a discussion, get some more topics uh, out in the air, and then come back in May to have a follow-up, and, and uh, uh, Acting Provost McMaster's office will be able to take what, what we are interested in today and try to gather more information for us. So we have 40 minutes. We could do this for days, uh, but we have 40 minutes, and we're going to keep it to that and then continue the conversation in May. So with that, please. Chair Omari, uh, members of the committee, um, uh, Chair Omar was exactly right. There's just a tremendous amount of information here, and the frustration is we're just going to be able to scratch the surface of this incredibly complicated topic, um, but we'll do the best we can. I have a colleague here, uh, Tina Faulkner, who's the Director of Student Finance. Um, you should know that it's Tina who has to balance our books with the federal government of hundreds of millions of dollars down to the cent, 
If she doesn't, she goes to jail. And so um, I'm delighted that she's in that job. Uh, we also have a student uh, who will join us um, shortly, uh, uh, Nora uh, Takia, and she's going to talk about her experiences with student finance. So with that, let's get started. Um, this is the outline. Uh, we wanted to remind you that we have a set of financial aid principles. Uh, they're both regental principles as well as specific principles that um, the provost's office has generated. And so as we proceed through this conversation and other conversations, we wanted you uh, to be mindful of that. Uh, we have some policy questions that we're interested in, in getting your feedback on. Uh, they're listed here, uh, just a few of them. Uh, how to make certain we have aligned federal, state, and University of Minnesota financial aid strategies. Remember, we don't do this by ourselves. We get a tremendous uh, amount of money from the federal government and the state government. Uh, how can the university promote financial literacy and awareness of loan debt? Um, we're also going to talk about financial literacy. Um, this is a graph we're going to start with and come back to. It's a graph that shows average student loan debt uh, for numerous institutions in the state of Minnesota. Uh, you should know that the average indebtedness upon graduation is around 32,000. That's the red bar in the middle. Um, you can see that those institutions that have much higher debt are obviously the privates. Um, the good news here is you can see the University of Minnesota institutions, all of us, uh, clustered over on the right-hand side. Um, Twin Cities is the yellow bar, and our, our um, uh, colleagues are in the maroon bars and we all have relatively low debt compared to that average. Um, you should know that the state of Minnesota has the ninth highest debt in the country. Um, that's something we should be proud of. And we're the only state in that category from the upper middle west. Uh, this graph shows the uh, percent of bachelor degree recipients without student loan debt. You'll see this is a slightly different number than we've used before um, because what we're looking at here is only new freshmen. You're going to see another number later that includes a graduating class. Um, but again, if you look at the percent graduating without debt, uh, University of Minnesota Twin Cities is on the right-hand side at 42%. That's a good news story. And uh, all of the, the system campuses are on the right-hand side of this. We're also pleased, oh, are you going to do this? Go ahead, no, go ahead. Uh, the next slide that you see is the cohort default rate for the Twin Cities campus. And as you can see, we are significantly lower than our peer institutions. And uh, if you care to know how the cohort default rate is calculated, I can tell you or we can keep moving. We'll, we'll, we'll see if anybody asks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Don't and just ask. so you know, the, the, the average of... Uh, Cohort default rate for the same time period throughout the country is 10.8. Oh. The next two tables show you the entire gift aid picture, first for the system and then for the Twin Cities. So as you look at this, you can see the basic categories of gift aid that we distribute to students in our packaging. University scholarships, Pell, state grant, and so on. There's one uh, uh, peculiarity to this that I wanted to point out. And that is these numbers get inflated in 2009, 10, excuse me, 2010 and 2011 because of the federal stimulus money that gets added into the state grant. But overall, we can see that in the categories, and in particular university scholarships, that number's been going up. You can see the same pattern, of course, when we disaggregate the data down to the uh, Twin Cities campus. We have one of these charts for every single one of the campuses, if any members of the board want to see these. So if you look at this slide, this is a system-wide view of undergraduate total student loan borrowing. And the good news story of this is that student loan borrowing overall is down. And we have more information about that later on. You will see that uh, Federal borrowing, which is usually the best option for students, is still also down. But you will also notice that private lending is up. We don't know the story behind that necessarily because we don't ask students. They may choose to go with a private lender that they already have a relationship with. 
but we do track this in the system because through private lenders, when students apply for private loans, they have to certify that they are enrolled and that they are, uh, there's room within their financial aid package for them to take out the loan. So we do include that in all of our data on it. This does not include parent borrowing through the Parent PLUS program. So we have been asked about private loans for some time, and we're, we're starting to dig a lot deeper into the information we have on that. These are just a few examples of the private lenders that the university works with. Some of these will look very familiar to you. Our four largest ones are Sally May, Wells Fargo, Discover, and the Bank of North Dakota. These are some sets of debt that a family may incur that we don't have a way to capture. We don't know if someone takes out a home equity loan or if they're borrowing from a family member. We have no way to capture that data. So for the next two hours, I'll be talking about this particular <laughs> graph here. Uh, this is what we call the Zetter graph, um, produced originally by Peter Zetterberg, an analyst here. And it's the graph that uh, President Kayla referred to earlier this morning. What it shows is by income level, and for each income level, um, we also show the expected family contribution, the EFC. Uh, it shows as you move to the right, move to higher income levels, um, the amount of gift aid, Pell, state grant, institutional aid, in the blue, maroon, and yellow starts to fade out. And it, the type of curve you would want to see. Um, you can see the other forms of, of financial aid here, private grants, student loans, parent loans, U of M employment. What you see is, again, as you move to the right with higher incomes, the non-financial aid part, that's what the family is expected to contribute to the cost of attendance goes up. So in theory, um, this graph is exactly what we would want to see in terms of leveraging most of the gift aid, the, the free money, at the lower income levels. Uh, this graph shows the average borrowing um, that occurs at the different income levels. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory, but what you can see, interestingly, is that um, in terms of the per percent of students who borrow, I'm sorry, not the amount, the percent of students who borrow, it peaks out in the 140 to 160 and 120 to 140 ranges. You also see the percent who are borrowing uh, in the black dash line as you move across the income ranges. We're very concerned about debt at graduation. That's one of your primary uh, questions that we get each year. These are the newest data on that. And so system-wide, again, um, these are system data. We have one of these charts for each one of our campuses. Uh, the percent, you can see the percent who don't borrow, excuse me, who, yeah, who don't borrow, no debt, ranges from 29% to 44%. And you can see for each one of the campuses, both the average debt and the median debt for those who borrow. That's what's critical here. This is the number for those who borrow. The next graph, uh, again, disaggregates this to the Twin Cities, looking at the data temporally. The good news here is that the percent with no debt has gone up nearly 10 points from 35%. So at one point, it dipped to 34%, so uh, 34 to 44. And the average amount has been going down. So right now that stands at 25,000. So this lore that students have 40, 50,000 in debt is really not the case, and the numbers have been trending downward. And this graph simply shows, again, the average debt at graduation. So we're, we're very concerned about timely graduation and the relationship of timely graduation to indebtedness. Um, recent B, or Regent Beeson made the point earlier about the relationship between uh, uh, the incoming class metrics and graduation rates and indebtedness that gets to that. So obviously, as you move from a four-year to a five-year to a six-year graduation, the percent who borrow go up, 
and the amount obviously goes up. Now, the question we often get looking at the means, why is it only going up from 24 to, to 33? Well, as students trip into that fifth year and sixth year, they're, they often um, uh, are, are looking for other ways to pay for their education through work uh, or other mechanisms instead of continued borrowing. And this is a graph that I showed earlier, simply uh, graphically depicting the impact of not graduating in four years. We also hear a lot of stories about the number of students who are borrowing uh, millions of dollars to do their undergraduate work. Um, that's not quite the case. Here you're looking at the average student debt uh, for the distribution of average student debt for 2017-18, Twin Cities bachelor's degrees. You can see again the number who graduated with no debt. There's 3,300 of those. But as you look at the distribution, um, there are probably a dozen students who graduate with more than 100,000. Uh, I would argue those students didn't pay attention in our financial literacy courses and, and modules because there's absolutely no excuse to graduate from this university um, with that amount of debt. If we remove the no debt students, this just readjusts the curve, uh, removing those 3,300 students, which enables you to basically see the numbers and the distribution a bit more clearly. Uh, we want to remind you of the 2018-19 costs of attendance. Um, we're slightly over 28,000. Um, this is the, the number the federal government requires us to put on our website. And when we compute the, the net price numbers, it's based on this cost of attendance. Now, this is the second complicated graph I put up here. And this is worth spending just a few minutes on, because it gets into the philosophy of our need-based packaging. And every time I show you this graph, it gets a bit more complicated because we add some additional information. The basic graph shows what would happen with, a, with four different income scenarios based on adjusted gross income. It's 2,500, low income, uh, 50,000, low middle, 99,000, middle, upper middle, and the 120, there's reasons we do the 999. The 120 we use because that's the upper end of the promise program. So that's that constraint. For each one of those columns, you can see based on the FAFSA, the cost of attendance number, um, you can see what the EFC would be for that family. So if you're a family making 25,000, the family's uh, 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 is, is, is obligated by the federal government to pay zero. That's the, that's the calculation. If in fact you're making 120,000, the EFC from the federal government says you should be able to contribute $27,000 a year to your daughter or son's education. For these students, you can see a typical financial aid package that we would apply to that student. This is system-wide. Uh, Tina's financial aid office packages for the system. So at the lowest income, you can see that the student would receive 6,000 in Pell, 6,200 in state grant, a modest $600 SEOG, Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, uh, and then the U Promise at about 4,100. That student also would be offered 2,700 in work study, and then would be offered two loans to bring them up to the cost of attendance, realizing that student could certainly also have received a merit scholarship. This is all based on need. What I like to point out here is for the 14,500 tuition and fees number on the Twin Cities campus, before work study, that student's receiving 17,000. Um, we think that's a good model to have, that we're packaging, we're, we're putting most of our financial aid on the lowest income students, trying to get them as close as possible to the cost of attendance. 
for that family making 25,000, a student loan at 5,500 and a parent loan at 3,000 is a real struggle. Um, and you can see then across the, the income spectrum what happens. Another no, uh, uh, number I'll note is that for that family making 120, all the need base aid zeroes out. There's a modest, very modest promise grant, modest work study, and the parent loan goes up to about 21,500. Now what happens there? The expectation is that the family is contributing to the cost of that uh, education, not borrowing that money. Okay, so that's worth paying some attention to. We have some net price graphs here. Oh, I'm sorry, we have a, um, a um, student employment graph. Um, we, we like to point out that the expectation is that students will be doing some work uh, at, at, while they're going to school. And so this shows basically the distribution of on-campus and off-campus hours employed per week. This next two set of slides are going to be looking at, or they show to you the average net price for the fall 2015 new freshman class. The first slide is for families earning $75,000 or less. And the average net price is calculated by subtracting the average amount of federal, state, and institutional grant and scholarship aid from the total cost of attendance, what Bob just talked about. And you will see that all of the University of Minnesota campuses are on the lower end for all of the regional campuses near us and uh, other campuses that we often lose our students to. What this means is that the University of Minnesota is affordable to families in this income bracket. This slide just shows if we are to bump it up to 110,000 or less, we still remain competitively priced with our regional competitors. So on to uh, savings plans. This is one of the most surprising graphs that I've seen in my 12 years in this job. Um, this shows you the annual assets saved for college in the upper Midwest states. Uh, and comparing, comparing uh, six different states uh, and the troubling piece of this that you see is Minnesota is at the low end. Uh, John Bursick Dreyer, my financial aid analyst, um, computed these. So a few, few facts about the graph you're looking at. Wisconsin has three times the savings per child as Minnesota. Iowa has seven times the savings per child as Minnesota. Uh, what's, what's even more surprising is Minnesota has a higher income, average income, than either one of those states. Why does Minnesota have lower 529 assets and savings per child? Well, who, who really knows? But in some ways, it might be related to tax codes. So it wasn't until 2017 that that was the first year Minnesota provided tax incentives. Most other states with an, with an income tax had deductions or credits for the 529 savings. We did not. Minnesota deduction is capped at 3,000. North Dakota is capped at 10,000. Iowa is capped at 6,700 6, and so on. So there are certain tax implications that have undoubtedly affected the troubling graph that you're looking at here. Uh, these were standardized, by the way, you should know, uh, standardized by the no, uh, population under 18 um, years old. This graph shows, and this is good for anybody with small children in the room, um, what you need to be saving from the get-go to make sure you could cover the full cost of attendance to go to the University of Minnesota. So if your child was born today, you better be saving $202 a month. If you, if you postpone that until the child's 10, you need to be saving now $560 a month to cover the full cost of attendance. So an interesting graph. Next 
we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the University of Minnesota's approach to financial literacy or financial education. And for the past 10 plus years, the university has taken a multifaceted approach to financial literacy. Uh, both the Twin Cities campus and the Duluth campus have very strong, long-standing, robust financial literacy programs. Both work with students in a variety of different ways to help them better understand their finances. The focus of all of these efforts is to meet students where they are and without any shame or blame. On the Twin Cities campus, the Live Like a Student Financial Wellness Campaign, students are taught about budgeting and spending, banking basics, understanding credit, loans and debt management, and identity theft. All of our one-stop counselors on the Twin Cities campus and many of my financial aid staff are certified wellness, financial wellness counselors who meet with students one-on-one -on -one to discuss finances and finance-related questions. These are personal to the student and the questions that they have. We also do classroom presentations, small and large group presentations, and have partnered with the Effective U team to deploy online tools and tutorials for students. Yep, we can do this. Uh, what you have in front of you here is the, it's a mock-up, it's not a real student, because we don't have any students named Goldie Gopher, <laughs> but this is our student, we call it borrowing history, and uh, most schools call it a debt letter, and for lots of students, debt letter is too scary of a language. But all of our students are presented, our degree-seeking students, are presented in July with this when we send them their estimated, or their actual financial aid package. It shows them their aggregate borrowing that we have at the University of Minnesota, that we have in our system, and what we're able to pull in from the federal system. What we find the most uh, interesting and surprising to our students is we show them what their average monthly payment will be based on their debt on a standard 10-year repayment plan. It doesn't seem just like a big, large number. It's going to be a certain amount that you need to pay every month, and that's really important. And you will see this is very short, and we did that on purpose because we wanted the focus to be on the aggregate loan debt. So just to wrap up here, um, we did an a unscientific survey of my uh, undergraduate advisory board, uh, and many of them provided some interesting information on how they pay for their university education. These are some summary numbers from the survey uh, in terms of how they pay. So for instance, the parental contribution for these students varied from zero to 9,000. And we also have uh, six specific stories from the students on how they pay. So for instance, with student B, they're taking out 7,500 in loans, they received a $12,750 scholarship and 3,000 in grants. Um, so it's just an interesting uh, uh, sweep of different ways that students are paying for their education. Now, best of all, we have a, a student here to talk about her experiences. She's going to spend just a few minutes. Uh, Nora um, Takia is going to come up, and she's going to describe some of the ways she's paid for her education and some of the struggles. Great. Welcome, Ms. Takia. Um, members of the board, uh, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Nora Takia, and I am a senior in the College of Biological Sciences pursuing a genetics, cell biology, and development major, and a statistics minor. In my time at the University of the Minnesota, I've had the chance to meet with several different individuals from different socioeconomic backgrounds. And today, I'd like to take some time to share some of my own perspectives as an out-of-state student from Colorado. I would also like to take a bit of time to present um, some in-state perspectives from my co-presenter, Sophie, who was unfortunately unable to make it to today's meeting. Uh, from the time that I started applying to universities, my parents were determined to have me enter the workforce debt-free. And because of that, they told me not to take out any loans on my end and that they would do whatever it took on their end to accomplish that. And it was really their dedication towards helping me reach my future goals that inspired me to try and find ways to make contributions to their efforts. 
And well, in a similar sense, Sophie also wanted to graduate without any debts and without any loans too, because she's actually aiming to go to medical school, which she knows is a very costly endeavor. And um, unlike me, however, Sophie wasn't actually, I mean, she didn't really have any contributions from her parents on in terms of uh, undergrad funding, and so she had to find other avenues to find financial aid. Uh, well, my parents have started planning for college when I was young. Uh, many students start preparing for uh, undergraduate education while they're in high school. For example, on my end, I actually um, took a lot of AP classes and I because I knew I'd be able to clear a lot of liberal, liberal education credits with those. And um, I also made sure to ask about scholarship and financial aid advice from both my parents who went to graduate school in the US and also from my high school counselors and my regional coordinators. And actually it was from my UMN regional recruiter, Nick Keller, that I learned of my chances of getting the Gold National Scholarship, which is this four year merit based scholarship directed towards out of state students like me. And actually it was a result of this scholarship that I was able to come to the University of Minnesota in the first place because it actually made the costs of attendance here like comparable to in-state institutions such as CU Boulder. And um, as a result of that, I was able to go to the University of Minnesota with um, the degree that I wanted and also with 41 credits underneath my belt, which allowed me to pick up a statistics minor and also graduate within three years time. And um, on the other hand, Sophie also took a lot of AP classes as she wanted to kind of save up some time to pursue extracurricular activities for her medical school degree. And unlike me though, she was very, very proactive in trying to find those internal and external scholarships. And because of that, she was actually able to cover her cost of attendance for her full four years within the College of Biological Sciences. And uh, well, while a large portion of our efforts took place in high schools, Sophie and I continued to find like ways to try and bring down our costs um, outside of scholarships. And well, on my end, I utilized a lot of the tips that I learned from the university's financial wellness uh, module that you kind of have to take as a freshman. And it actually helped me to make a budget for food, groceries, and other external costs. Well, I also chose to live at an apartment within walking distance from the campus and within walking distance to public transport because, well, it's cold. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and also, like, that really helped me to bring down commuting costs. I also worked for federal work study funds as a writing consultant at the Center for Writing, which is a position that I really, really wanted because um, writing and helping people with writing has always been a hobby of mine. And I thought it was a great reprieve from my um, typical STEM classes because um, I cleared my liberal education credits, so I didn't really have any room elsewhere. Um, on the other hand, Sophie focused a lot of her efforts on like bringing down those external costs because um, positions within CBS, if you're aiming for research or internship, are largely unpaid volunteer positions. And she also like continued to keep applying to those scholarships because CBS provides a lot of annual merit and need-based scholarships for their students, and there's a lot of different avenues with which they can pursue um, those scholarships. And well, if there's one thing that I learned about navigating finances in the three years that I was at the University of Minnesota, it's that there are a lot of different avenues with which students can alleviate the cost of attendance. And while many of the students I talk to think that the big contributors are the only ones that matter, like scholarship, family contributions, and loans, what I've learned is a lot of the everyday actions and lifestyle choices that one makes can make a huge difference in how much they save in the long run. Well, thank you so much for your time, and I hope those perspectives are helpful. Thank you very much. Members, I'm going to open it up uh, for questions. We have exactly 12 minutes, so I think what might make sense is if we, I mean, feel free to ask whatever questions you want, but note that in 12 minutes I'm going to end the conversation. So uh, what I think might be important is to be thinking about questions and thoughts that were not included in this presentation so that we can let the acting provost know and he can make note of that so then in the May conversation we can come back and have another con uh, a larger conversation. So I'll start with Regent Simonson, then we'll go to Regent Anderson, then we'll go to Regent Powell, and then we'll just go around the whole table because I know everybody's going to raise it. Thank you, Chair Amari, and thank you for the presentation. I, I appreciate it. I understand it's a complicated and multifaceted issue. And uh, I realize there are 
students that don't have the discipline that this student apparently does. I understand that as well, and that contributes to the problem. But um, two, two quick questions. When you look at the family, because I know some exceptions to this, as you've heard me say maybe more than once uh, to this situation, where I had this intern this summer who had uh, uh, public, his parents are public school teachers, but he has siblings. So when you look at this I income of family that they had also help, uh, do you look at the family size, the number of students at the same time? That's number one. And is the financial literacy required for students coming in? Acting Provost McMaster. Yes, uh, Chair Omari and Re Regent Simonson. The, the FAFSA does adjust for the size of the family. So the expected family contribution would be larger for those, um, spent, uh, excuse me, would be less for those families um, where you have two or more um, kids in school. It's still the expected family contribution is a number that's highly problematic because it doesn't even come close to the real cost. In terms of the, is the um, financial literacy, um, um, are, are these programs obligatory? The module in the fall that students take is obligatory. Any additional kinds of education would not be obligatory. Okay, thank you. Regent Anderson. Yeah, I've got uh, just a couple comments, and uh, I know I'll, go, I'll be real quick with them, and you don't even have to answer them. Pell grants, federal grants, state grants haven't really went up from 2009 to 2018, so that's somewhat of a problem. They haven't went up. Uh, our lowest income students, families, if they get a Pell State and a Promise scholarship, they would bring in $16,000, and our tuition is fourteen, dollars so they have living expenses. Uh, I was interesting on the slide on $200. That's what we started saving for our boys. We had two boys back in 1994 and 98, and putting $200 in a 529 plan and letting it compound, they both could virtually go to any college in the state of Minnesota mm -hmm. and have it paid for with their scholarship mm -hmm. contributions. So there are family choices, and... and you know, might not be going to Timberwolves games every night, but you might be putting two hundred dollars away. Uh, the other thing I'll say, how important uh, one of the problems—it's not a problem; it's a choice we have at, at the Minnesota Legislature. Matter of fact, this program should be great for the legislators to see. What you just went through would be great for them to see. Uh, the five twenty-nine tax savings plan isn't the only problem why that can implemented late. Minnesota has a state ta state income tax of five to nine percent. South Dakota has zero, North Dakota is much less. So my argument is if we're going to be a high tax state, then we should be a high appropriation state for the kids, students to go to college. And finally, I'll just say uh, if we don't start teaching financial literacy and the choices that have to be made in college, the, the students will never understand about where the money comes from. So I, I just think it's – I've been talking about teaching financial literacy for four years here, and I'm a big believer in it. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Anderson. And, and one of the things that we talked about in our uh, prep meeting after the May uh, uh, follow-up is to package this nicely and hand it off to our friends in St. Paul. Uh, Regent Powell. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, good presentation. Lots of data. Really, really helpful. I think we're probably all going to nibble on the edges a little bit. But you know, so, so one, you know, the, 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 the real high levels of debt showed that one chart uh, where and depends on how you define it. I mean, to me, someone who at 21 graduates with 70,000 in debt, I think that's a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And then you've got 100,000. So is there a way that we could cap it? Or is there something that we do just to say we're, we're not going to have that in our institution? It's just we know it's not right. We know that they're never going to get out from under that. So we're going we're, we're gonna to do everything we can to make, make it zero above that level of debt. Sure, you've t thought about it. The other, the other comment is, um, I mean, there are a lot of people around the table who were of similar vintage, and I bet every one of us worked in college. And in fact, I got admitted. They said, "Here's the tuition. You get a scholarship, and by the way, show up at this office because you're going to get a job." And it it made a huge difference. And so the whole, you know, is there an opportunity to? you know, kind of think about the whole work study. I mean, it would be an initiative, but given the levels of indebtedness, maybe maybe that's a, maybe that's a, you know, a mine worth digging in. 
Acting Provost McMaster. You know, um, Chair Omari and Regent Powell, just a quick note on this, and then I think I'll let Director Faulkner chime in as well, because she's really uh, in the trenches on this. In terms of debt control, the federal debt is controlled. Students can only borrow, um, I think it's 5,500 in the first years, I may be off, and then 5,000 in the junior, excuse me, it goes up 6,000 in the junior and senior year. We have no control over the private loans. They can go out and take a $30,000 private loan if they're credit worthy, and there's absolutely no control we have on that. In terms of employment, I, I think that's that's uh, terrific. I'd love to see a much higher percentage of our students work, um, not only uh, for debt mitigation and to help with their finances. We find that students who work 10, 15 hours a week are better students. Uh, you can see it in their GPAs. Unfortunately, there are limited resources, uh, and it goes beyond work study. There are a lot of students that are not work study. But if I could may, wave my magic wand, I'd make sure that 90% uh, of our students had some opportunity. The other piece of that is often when you're employed at the university, your supervisor acts as a mentor for you. And so there's, there's a family you build here through that. So it's all good. Thank you. Uh, Chair Omari, Regent uh, Powell, you are absolutely correct. However, I'm going to do a quick amendment to that. If they, uh, students cannot borrow more than the cost of attendance. That's one of the things that we verify. If it's not a loan that goes through us, they take out their home equity line of credit and they have $50,000, then they could. But otherwise, they cannot borrow over the cost of attendance. That being said, someone could borrow uh, a lot. And so um, there is a tiny allowance within the Department of Ed guidelines for us that we can opt not to give someone a loan. However, they will not back us if someone sues us for discrimination. And the few schools that have tried that have been sued. And so what we try to do, and uh, when we package students, and we can talk about this again in, in the spring if you want to, if we get a spring. Um, and <laughs> uh, we package students at what they are maximally allowed to take out. Right. We then are doing education, and we have a slide in there that we can talk about at some other time, where we are educating students of if we package you at 5,500, because that's what you are allowed. If you only need 3,000, only borrow 3,000. If you find you need it later on, you can ask if there's still room in your package, we can add it in. We do find that students now, as we're trying to have more conversations about financial literacy, are not just taking it because it's there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, and perhaps a, in May, a conversation about work study in, in how much of the federal government pays for that, how sure. much we have to pay for that. How, if we can supply the full demand of work study or not and what that looks like and if it relates to uh, operational excellence, that would be interesting as well. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, first, uh, I want to do a mulligan with the, the provost. Um, Office of Higher Ed, uh, the uh, seniors in the state are roughly 25.26% students of color, but the graduates, which demonstrates the achievement gap challenge we face, is about 2197 It was actually the Department of Education. All students in, in E12, um, it actually comes out to be nearly a third uh, our, our students of color, so you can see where that, that trend line is, is, is heading. Um, I, uh, I also enjoyed um, listening to my colleague, uh, Regent Sviggum, um, give the quote, and it was literally word for word from 30 years ago, which is, the best financial aid is low tuition. The first author of that statement, maybe not the first ever, but the first in my experience, was David Rowe, the Regent David Rowe, the retired president of the AFL-CIO. And so to bring you two together on, <laughs> uh, over this philosophical uh, uh, discussion, I think, is, is, is magical, and I appreciate that. Um, I, language is powerful, and I, you know, we, we, we keep referring to you know, low-income students. I, I would actually suggest that all students are low-income. Um, other than maybe some really exceptional student who either comes back with already with a career or somebody who inherited property with rental income or something. But the vast majority of students, you know, are working in a relatively low 
uh, wage positions. It, and so really it become, it's, it's a function of students who come from a, a low expected family contribution. I mean, there, there, there is a distinction, which, which actually raises you know, one of the questions um, that, that I have. And I've got two real quick ones, Mr. Chair, and then we'll move on. Uh, the first one is, do we ever do a process? Do we have any process to determine that when we have expected family income, do we sample to find out how many of those students actually have access to the resources that we're, that we're attributing? Chair Amari and Regent Rosha, I think I'll answer the question with it depends. And the reason I would say that is if, if families are selected for verification, yes, they have to provide us with their tax documents. We, we do hear from students who say, yes, my EFC is calculated off the FAFSA at, let's say, twelve to 14000 My parents are not willing to pay that. We cannot override that. It is we, if we had buckets of money and we didn't have to, um, and we didn't have to package them with loans. If we had, as we talked about earlier, an, an enormous endowment where we could provide families who are students who are not technically independent per the regulations, but are independent in the sense that their families aren't going to pay it, then we could. But otherwise, it is based on verification. Mr. Chair, just uh, and, yeah, and, I, and that's we we can mitigate that. Because obviously, the more you sort of rely on that through you know higher and higher tuition, the more likely you run into those circumstances mm -hmm. where it becomes a, a terrible challenge for somebody uh, through no fault of their own that, that they don't have access to any of the of the support yep. that's that's expected. I'll, I'll yield my other question until the next conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, we can take uh, other stuff off offline and bring it back for May. So thank you, Regent Johnson, then Regent Lucas, and then Regent Be Beeson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In our discussions here in the board, one of the concerns that students have is mental health. And uh, I will again sound like I come from the uh, 50s and the 60s, which I do, but there are some lessons learned. And I appreciate the young woman and your sacrifice that you have made for your education, a deep amount of sacrifice. And one of the things that we discover in life is if we have a debt load whatever our age, it wears on us. It affects our mental, mental health. And students are no different than uh, others. And uh, we're learning that more, more and more. Um, indulge with me for a moment. Uh, I grew up on a farm in southeastern Minnesota. And when time 1965 came to go to college, I didn't know how I was going to pay for it. But my mom said, don't worry. You know, we haven't taken vacation in 43 years, and I've saved that money because I want our two children to go to college. It was a deep, deep sacrifice. When I graduated from college, I had saved just a little money from my bus driving days at Luther College, Decor, Iowa, and I took my parents on vacation, the first vacation they ever had. Now, it sounds like an Abe Lincoln story. I understand that, but uh, my, my point is, that, that our society and our culture sometimes falls into the bucket of, what are you going to give to me? And education does cost. It costs money. It costs uh, a great deal of sacrifice. And I have a deep amount of respect for this student and what you've gone through. And um, so the lesson learned and is, and we're driving in a positive direction about less debt for our students upon graduation. When I graduated from college, I had zero debt. When I graduated from grad school, I had zero debt. And it makes a difference in your outlook in life. And we were not wealthy. We were just average, ordinary folks in southeastern Minnesota. My mom and dad said, you're not going to have debt as you begin your, as you begin your career. So I, I tie that together in this whole mental health thing because it does, it, it looms back here. If, you're, if you graduate from the university and you've got thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, you think, I gotta pay this back, get a job, it affects the way you look at life and it affects your productivity uh, about life. So all of these things about tuition, debt, all fit, in my opinion, fit together. It's an extremely important issue, Mr. Chairman. And I'm glad we've had this discussion. And I thank you for your time.
Indeed, uh, that's spot on. And one of the presenters mentioned it earlier. So thank you for uh, reiterating that. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Amari. Um, you mentioned that the module in the fall is obligatory. Could you explain to me what the module is? What, what, do, what do they get? 30-second pitch. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Chair Omari, Regent Lucas, it's from a company called EverFi that we contract with. And it basically goes, it's, it's an online module, and it goes through um, borrowing and, and, and uh, daily expenses and some practical ways that students can think about uh, minimizing the cost of education, um, a lot of it practical in nature. So it's an online required it is. Uh, to be truthful, we have no way of yeah. actually enforcing that every student does that. We don't kick them out of school if they don't take it, but um, uh, they're highly encouraged to do it. And I think there's a, there's a fairly high participation rate. What would it take to package all this financial literacy and so forth and actually make it part of um, a freshman experience? I think it would make a huge difference to how people manage their four years. Think about it. Okay. And, and we could put a hold on their registration until they do the module, correct? Uh, we try not to put holds on registration unless we absolutely have to. Um, I, I don't think that would rise to the level of a registration hold. <laughs> Barely you do. <laughs> Maybe I should never have kids because my parenting style might be a little straight. <laughs> Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would you? Put back up the slide about average debt by income. Isn't there a slide on that? So imagine if you're a family with income under $120,000, or let's say under $50,000, and what your debt load would be if you didn't have a Pell Grant or a state grant or a Promise Scholarship? Um, those, uh, sure. have, those, those are all, every additional dollar of need would have to be borrowed mm -hmm. by those families. Uh, uh, Chair Omari and Regent Beeson, I can't really answer that question because I think it would vary a lot ba based on family circumstances and how much they could contribute, but it would be a lot. Okay, yeah. Mr. McMaster, my point, Mr. Chair, is that loans are the last dollars in. Mm -hmm. Correct. Bar, that's the last dollar that goes in. And so I'm making the assumption that for those families, without that need to be paid, they're going to be borrowing the rest of those dollars, including the money that they that they, they get from us for the Promise Scholarship. So Most likely. Okay, so we are, this need-based aid allows for an equal start once they're done with college. There, there's about an, it's, there's some disparity by income, but without those dollars, they're starting out at a huge disadvantage. And for the ones that go to a private school or, um, you know, that don't have this, so I support this need-based state. You can see it right here. Without those dollars, without our dollars, their loans would be higher than they are on this illustration. Unquestionably. Yeah. That's, that's a great uh, point and a great display right there. Uh, with that, members, we will continue this conversation in, in May. Um, uh, and thank you for, for putting this together. Uh, it's clearly something that we need to continue talking about. Uh, Acting Provost McMaster will comment very briefly on the consent report that is an action item. So uh, we will need to, uh, this is review and action, sorry. And please note that there is a slightly revised uh, report with the MIN, or sorry, uh, consent report with the MIN drive report in there as well. Um, in terms of the consent agenda, the first is the, re is the request for approval of the 2019 post-secondary planning joint report to the Minnesota legislature. This biennial report reflects the long-term, ongoing, and effective working relationships between the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State to develop and coordinate post-secondary programs in the Twin Cities and throughout Minnesota. It's an obligation of the state that we produce this. I think it is every other year. Thank you for that. Uh, and after that, any comments or questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent report. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes, and we are adjourned, members. Thank you. Thank you.